at two and a half miles back. Indianapolis is about speed. The quickest driver, the ultimate lap. No race is faster, no race is closer or more difficult, but Indy is much more. The 500 mile race is a celebration, a spectacle, the largest single gathering of people for a sporting event. Indianapolis is dangerous. Its narrow road and concrete walls tear at man and machine. A skillful drive can turn to disaster without warning. But the quickest times are found just inches from the walls. It is there the poles must drive. Searching for the fastest lap, even the bravest are not without fear. There's not been a race I have not been in that at one time or another I hadn't scared myself. And I'm one of the few that admit it. I know you got a bunch of brave heroes out there say they're not scared of nothing. All I can say, they've never run fast enough or they've never been hurt. To drive Indy requires skill, to race at the front, dedication, to win courage. A champion must push beyond fear. The four corners at Indianapolis draw out a special significance. You know, there, there comes a time in a race where money doesn't matter, living doesn't matter, winning is the only thing that matters. And so when you go into those corners, it's winning that tells all. This past month at Indianapolis has challenged the elite. Even the best, like four-time champion Rick Mears, came face to face with his own frailty. Rick would walk away. Three-time world champion Nelson Piquet barely escaped. But running on and over the edge is the only way to succeed, the only path to victory in the Indianapolis 500-mile race. This place, more than any other, will probably push you to the limit, to the very limit, because there's so much at stake. And there comes a time when you just say, man, you've got to go for it. The time is now. 33 of the fastest have accepted the challenge and are ready for racing's ultimate test. 500 miles on a Sunday afternoon in Indiana. Where will the road take them? Too close to the walls or to victory lane with its fame and fortune? Indy is a human struggle against all odds. It brings pain and anguish, while at the same time, incomparable reward. In its 81-year history, 589 drivers have started the run. But the Indianapolis 500 has only permitted 54 to make the final turn into victory lane. As this day begins, the focus is 200 laps away. An antique cup waits for the new champion, whose likeness will be molded in silver to join the historic line. The 500 miles lie ahead. Live from the world's greatest race course, it's the 76th running of the greatest spectacle in racing, the Indy 500. The drivers in the front row have arrived in the garage area. Our three pit reporters, Gary Gerald, Jerry Punch, and Jack Root, are watching their final preparations. Well, certainly, Paul, the anxieties of the pre-race regimen, no stranger to Mario Andretti. This is the 27th time he's gotten ready for the 500 miles. He's upbeat, confident here in his garage, renewing acquaintances with singer Amy Grant, his son Michael, wondering if this might be the day that that elusive second win is his. There's an air of confidence here in the Ganassi garage, a cautious optimism, if you will, as 34-year-old Eddie Cheever is set to become possibly just the second driver in 25 years to collect his first IndyCar win, and this, the greatest spectacle in racing. His crew arrived at 4 a.m., but Roberto Guerrero only got here about two hours ago, the latest he's ever come to the International Speedway. He's alone with his thoughts right now, thinking about what will be necessary to go from the pole position to his first victory ever, Paul Page, in the Indy 500. Well, it's right now about 47 minutes until the engines are commanded in life at this pinnacle event in racing. To win anywhere else earns money. To win Indy is a million dollars and a place in history. There is a swirl of excitement that will turn to a tornado when the green flag flies. We expect so very much today. Hello and welcome to Indy. I'm Paul Page on the coldest day I can remember for an Indianapolis 500 with a brisk wind out of the north. Now, three different high-tech engines are in a battle that has driven the field's average speed five miles an hour faster than last year's record. There are also a record ten former winners and seven rookies searching for a win here. Now, Roberto Guerrero with the Buick engine was the only man through the 230-mile-an-hour barrier on all four qualifying laps to set new records. 
but in the final practice, the four Ford engines were the fastest, led by Mario Andretti. The fastest Chevy in that practice belonged to Bobby Rahal, but it's last year's motor. Rick Mears and Emerson Fittipaldi have new Chevys, but they're still searching. Last year, Mears crashed in practice and then came back to score his fourth win. This year, he crashed again. Is it an unprecedented fifth win for the Rocket? Indy is long, hard, and dangerous. It has been a month full of incidents. So for each of these starting 33, there is a special challenge. Let's take a look at the field, made up of the traditional 11 rows of three. The field average, 223.4 miles an hour, nearly five miles an hour faster than last year. We'll start in the last row and move toward the front. In 33rd position is Canadian Scott Goodyear, driving a car that was qualified by Mike Roth. The center is rookie Ted Prappas and a 91 Lola Chevrolet, the slowest car in the field. This Californian keeps his hand-eye coordination sharp on the pistol range. Inside is Gordon Johncock, also driving a year-old car, but powered by a Buick. He only drives at Indy. Twice in 1973 and 82, Gordy's won here. The 82 win was the closest 500 ever. He beat Rick Mears by 16 one-hundredths of a second. In the 10th row, there are three-year-old Molas. Outside is the 1983 winner, Tom Sneva, also with Buick Power. Tom's not driven here for two years. In 1975, he barely touched another car in turn two and somersaulted his McLaren only to walk away. The center of the row is Dominic Dobson in his fifth Indy 500 start, driving a Lola Chevrolet. Inside is Jimmy Besser, the slowest rookie in the field until he was bumped. Then he came back in a second car to qualify as the fastest rookie. The field of 33 have collectively won $33 million in the Indy 500. ABC Sports presentation of the Indianapolis 500. Brought to you by Miller Lite. It's everything you want a beer to be. Miller Lite. It's it and that's that. By Goodyear. Number one in tires. By Craftsman. A line of 1,600 hand tools made in America guaranteed forever. And by AT&T, the right choice. Counting today's seven rookies, 596 drivers have started the Indy 500 since it began in 1911. Continuing the starting field at row nine and moving forward, two rookies sit in the ninth. In 27th starting spot is Lynn St. James, the second woman to qualify at Indy. At age 45, she's the oldest rookie ever. To prepare for the race, she has a chassis in her living room where she sits and visualizes the 500 miles. Another rookie, Brian Potter, is in the center, driving his first IndyCar race and first race ever on an oval track. Brian qualified on his father's 72nd birthday. Inside is Brazilian Raul Boisel, sitting in for injured Hiro Mashusta. When it's not horsepower, Raul is an accomplished show horse jumper. In the eighth row, outside, is 24-year-old Buddy Lazier. This is his second Indy 500. Last year, he crashed on the first lap. He started racing not as a driver, but as a skier. A.J. Foyt sits in the center, the first four-time Indy winner. Last year, A.J. was to retire after the race, but this year he's back, and the word retire is missing from his vocabulary. Another four-time winner, Al Unzer, is inside. He came here as a spectator, but now replaces the injured Nelson Piquet. The last time he replaced someone was 1987, when he won. Row seven on the outside, Jim Crawford is back with the same Buick power that carried him to sixth in 1988. He holds the fastest unofficial lap at the Speedway, but problems in time trials gave him 21st starting position. Driving as a teammate to A.J. Foyt is Jeff Andretti. Last year, he was voted Rookie of the Year. In November, he married Angelique, and they live near the rest of the family in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Coach Tracy is the test driver for the Penske team. Roger is giving the young Canadian a shot at Indy in a 1991 car. In the first week of practice, Paul got a nasty taste of the Indy walls, riding off a brand new car. A.J. Foyt, America wants to know, why are you back? Well, I'm back because I want to race, and I really enjoy it. What about starting in the eighth row for the for only the fourth time in your career? How are you going to race from there? Well, we're going to have to run pretty hard and just try not to get too far behind. It's not as good as where we started last year in the front row, but it's better not starting at all. There's another newsmaker in row nine, and for that, here's Gary Gerald. Jack, as Lynn St. James prepares now to realize a lifelong dream, Lynn, the question would be, 
As you look for your niche in indie history, what's the biggest concern? Well, I think the biggest concern is I don't want to make any mistakes, and even bigger than that, I want to make sure I don't get caught up in anybody else's mistakes. And I think, you know, that's something you really can't control, and you just hope that doesn't happen. Hope it's a good, safe day. Thanks. Wish you well. Thanks very much. Paul? Well, this track is difficult for everyone, especially the rookies. It was deadly for the reigning Formula Atlantic champion, Jovi Marcello. Jovi was the first Filipino driver in history here. He suffered fatal injuries in a freak accident while warming up. It was Jovi's dream to drive at Indianapolis. He was the first driver to be killed here in 10 years. Our plan, starting with the Buick and Jackaroot. The Buicks have proven they're quick. In fact, they get 10 inches more boost and put out about 75 more horsepower. But their valve train is powered by push rods. In the past, they've blown engines. Engineers say they've solved the problem, but the jury's still out. Chevrolet has been the engine of dominance in recent years, having won the last four Indy 500s in the last 39 IndyCar events overall. Drivers say that they may be down a bit on horsepower, but they drive with the confidence of a 94% engine reliability factor over the last six years. After 20 years, Ford has returned to IndyCar racing with an engine about half the size and some 90 pounds lighter than its counterparts. With the horsepower proven by qualifying, there are just two concerns. One, reliability. It hasn't been asked to go 500 miles under race conditions. And two, fuel efficiency. Remember, horsepower requires fuel, so the engineers believe this engine could get very thirsty before the afternoon is over. The last time a Buick finished in the top five was 1933 with Stubby Stubblefield at the wheel. Now here's more of our look at the 33 that will start the 500-mile drive. Continuing with the sixth row, the 18th starting position, John Paul Jr. snatched the 1983 Michigan 500 win from Rick Mears. This is his fourth Indy 500 start. Scott Pruitt drives everything. The True Sports IndyCar, the Trans Am, IMSA, IRA, and in April, the USS Birmingham, a nuclear-powered submarine. Philippe Gosh is driving in his first IndyCar race ever, the first Frenchman in the race in 52 years. His countryman, Rene Tomas, won at Indy in 1914 in a Delage. Philippe hopes for the same result. In row five, it's 31-year-old Eric Bachelard of Brussels, Belgium, the reigning Indy Lights champion in his first start at Indianapolis. John Andretti is in the center with four previous races here. Last year, he finished fifth. John raced midgets and sprint cars, just like his uncle Mario. He lives with his wife, Nancy, just a few miles from the racetrack. Stan Fox is a midget racing veteran in his fifth Indy 500. He'll start the number 91 inside row five. He loves fine machines like the motorcycle he customized. In the fourth row, Al Unser Jr. driving in his 10th Indy 500 in the new Alan Merton's design Galmer. On the track, little Al's as tough and focused as they come. Away from the track, he and his wife Shelly play life just a little bit looser. The 89 winner, Brazilian Emerson Fittipaldi, starts in the center. The former PPG Cup champion, twice a world champion, Emo's businesses range from automotive to oranges. Bobby Rahal is the 86 winner. He drives a newly formed IndyCar team using a Chevy-powered Lola. Bobby is both the driver and the owner, along with Carl Hogan. Emerson Fittipaldi, historically, you've been noted for aggressively attacking at the green flag. But today, Meyer, back in row four, have you reevaluated your approach to the start? Well, I tried to make a good start, but uh, it will be a long, long race. And... Uh, you know, like Roger, just talking to Roger a few minutes ago, and Roger C. Emerson remembers a long race, you know, 500 miles, and uh, I see how it goes, you know. I wait one or two laps, everybody to set it down, and then I try to go as fast as I can. Emerson Fittipaldi poised to pick up Indy win number two. Danny Sullivan at the edge of the garage area, a final interview. You still get nervous at Indianapolis. As Danny starts to make his way to the track, the engines are being warmed on the straightaway by the crews. Lynn St. James, the second woman in history to start an Indy 500. Janet Guthrie was the first. crowd moves toward their seats as driver and crews surround their cars. Now, another installment in our continuing series on what's new in sports, science, and technology.
Sports and Science Converge, brought to you by AT&T, sponsor of the 92 U.S. Olympic team. Auto racing at night is quite common at certain levels of the sport, but at the NASCAR level, it's never been done on a super speedway where speeds approach 170 miles per hour. Until last weekend, Musco Lighting developed a unique mirror-based lighting system for the Charlotte Motor Speedway, eliminating light poles on the track's interior and illuminating the track from two sides. The light source is uh, directed off of a reflector as it normally would be in normal sports lighting equipment. On the interior of the track, we then take it onto a specular mirror and then those mirrors are adjusted to very closely control the light so that we light up the cars, the surface, and the retaining walls. The 1,200 lights use 2 million watts of power. Even the drivers approve. They did a super job on their homework, got the lights uh, up in the right place. There's no glare or anything out there. It's just light running in the daylight. In just under 27 minutes, nearly 25,000 horsepower will roar into life on the main stretch. Now, more of the starting field. Continuing outside the third row, the ninth starting spot. Rick Mears driving for Roger Penske. His car is a Penske chassis with a second generation Chevrolet. Last year, he won the Indianapolis 500 for the fourth time. Two weeks ago, Rick was in this horrifying crash, sliding down the backstretch upside down. But miraculously, he walked away. Rick suffered a small fracture to his right wrist that makes it difficult to get out of the car, but doesn't affect his driving. 42-year-old Danny Sullivan is Al Unger Jr.'s new teammate. He'll drive a Galmer powered by a Chevy. In 1985, Danny was chasing Mario Andretti for the lead when he spun, but then came back to win. After a race, he can't wait to get home to Aspen, Colorado and his son, Driscoll. Scott Brayton held the one-lap record here in 1985. He'll drive a Buick-powered car like the one that gave him that record. Scott enjoys hosting groups visiting his garage, drawing them into the sport he loves. On May 5th, he hit the wall hard, but the crew repaired the car in time to qualify. Outside row two is Michael Andretti. Michael led the most laps in last year's race, 97. He is here with the new Ford engine designed for his Lola. He's written a kid's racing book that he shares with his children, Marco and Marissa. The center of the second row is Gary Bettenhausen, still searching for an Indy win with his Buick Lola. His father raced and died here. His brothers are both racers, but Gary's twin sons, Carrie and Todd, are both design engineers. The inside of row two is the 1990 winner, Dutch Minari Leyendijk. This is his first race this year. He'll drive a Ford Lola for Chip Ganassi. Last month, Ari was named one of People Magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People. In the first row are two men starting at the front for the first time and a former winner. Mario Andretti is outside in a Lola Ford. He won this race in 1969 to be kissed by Andy Granatelli. Mario loves motorcycles. He even tested a Formula One bike. Controversy clouded this lap one incident at Long Beach where he tangled with Eddie Cheever, eliminating both. Cheever will start beside Mario in the center of the front row, driving a similar Lola Ford. Eddie is also a writer, unpublished as yet. He considers his writing much too personal to allow others to read. The pole position is Roberto Guerrero, with a new one and four lap track record. Better luck than he's seen here before, he drives a Lola powered by a Buick. In 1987, Roberto was leading in the final laps of this race when he stalled his car trying to pull out of the pit. Al Unser roared past to take his fourth Indy 500 win. Roberto would finish in second place. Four months later, in a test session, he was seriously injured here. His career was in doubt as he laid in a coma for 17 days. But Roberto recovered, only to crash again here last year. This month, with racing luck and the strong support of his wife, Katie, he snatched the pole to lead the field to the green flag for the first time in his life. Unquestionably, Roberto Guerrero has proved the ability for record-breaking speed. Roberto, the question now, as you get ready for the race, how concerned about reliability in the Buick power plant are you? I think, Gary, that everybody, every, every 33 cars are there, we're all worried about reliability. I think the Buick has gotten to a point now where reliability wise we have as good a shot as anybody else 
He came close five years ago. He's been second twice today. It's his best opportunity to win. We wish you well. Thank you very much, Gary. Paul? Roberto Guerrero carries number 36. That number is not won since Louis Meyer carried it in 1933. The entire Andretti family, Mario, his two sons, Michael and Jeff, and nephew John now make their appearance at the head of Gasoline Alley and walk out into the pit area for the first time as the crowd welcomes them to Indy once again. And the defending champion, Rick Mears, Roger Penske driving him out. Remember, Rick has terribly tender feet after that accident earlier in the month. The pace car this year is a Cadillac Alante, the driver, three-time 500 winner, and our colleague Bobby Unser. Bobby will pace the race and then join us in the booth. Bobby knows well the apprehensions felt by all at the start. But Paul, the tension before the start here is caused by a long history of things going wrong. Today, the first trouble spot on the field is right in the front row with a feud between Mario Andretti and Eddie Cheever. Further back is a group of rookies. And remember, fully, one-third of the field doesn't even race regularly in Indy cars. Now, I started this race 19 times without ever getting used to the butterflies. Even when the starts were clean, it was still tough dealing with the unexpected. But believe me, there is nothing more exciting than the start right here at Indianapolis. And Bobby Unzer will be leading them down. Cadillac first paced the race in 1927. A.J. Boyd, supposed to retire last year, but he is back ready at Indy. And it has been a very dangerous month. Marcello's death, Piquet, Mashusta, Carter, all with broken bones. Is there a correlation between the speed and the danger? Today's race will be watched closely in an attempt to answer that question. Now, last year, when Rick Mears won his fourth Indy, speculation about a possible fifth win began immediately. A.J. Foyt and Al Unser, of course, have also won four, but they are in their 50s and considered, frankly, long shots for another win. Rick, on the other hand, has just turned 40, and he drives for the Penske team, the best in the business when it comes to winning this race. We decided to take a closer look at this man who, if he does win today, will become the undisputed king of Indy. Rick Ravon Mears grew up in Bakersfield, an oil and agricultural town in the Central Valley of California. His dad's hobby was racing, and from an early age, Rick and his brother were exposed to things mechanical. It was a close-knit family, and for them, racing was fun. I liked it, too, because I liked them all being involved in something together, and they were definitely involved in it. Every night we'd come in here and work on the race cars. At, we won a race one time in Riverside, so we had the money to build a shop because we used to work out there on the, in the back with a flashlight in our mouth and playing on them race cars at night. Let it roll, let it roll. I never did any of it to get anywhere. Didn't do a thing like that. I just did it because I enjoyed it. From the beginning, it was clear Rick was unnatural. He had the instincts, the sharp eyes, it was easy. Other drivers come up and say, well, what are you doing down in this corner? You know, what do you do to get through here? And, you know, and I'd say, what do you mean, what do I do to get through there? I don't know. I just do what feels right, whatever it takes. In the desert races, the terrain was always changing. Rick learned how to adapt to the situation moment to moment, an invaluable lesson for Indianapolis. You have one lap that's 800 or 1,000 miles long, you don't memorize it. So you have to stay on top of it 100%, concentrate for 10, 15, 20 hours, however long the race is. You drive what you see, not what you know. By the time he was 25, Rick had cut his hair and was on the road to Indy. Car owner Roger Penske spotted his talent, and despite the fact Rick failed to qualify this pink car, Penske, who needed to replace Mario Andretti, asked him to join the team. How would you like to maybe drive for us? I can't give anything other than Indy in a few races next year, depending on what happens to Andretti. Said, if you're interested, come on to the farmhouse, because uh, we were, that was kind of a week before we raced at Michigan, and Mears was there at 6 o'clock in the morning knocking on the door, so he was even aggressive in those days. Penske's team was at its zenith, and Rick won Indy in just his second year. Because it wasn't widely understood yet how good he really was, the impression lingered that he hadn't exactly paid his dues. 
Then, this fire erupted during a pit stop. Invisible flames causing chaos. He's trying to get out of his car. He just came into the pit. Rick's dad grabbed an extinguisher and put him out. But Rick had been burned painfully and scarred. The biggest risk here, of course, is inhalation. That's his farm up there. And the following year, he would suffer this loss to Gordon Johncock in the closest finish in Indy history. Rick had been hurt, and he had lost. His dues, it was said, were paid. His second Indy victory was the work of a maturing master. By now, the Penske team was like an extended family. An air of invulnerability surrounded him. He had been tested and found to be the real thing. He was a star, but not disrupted by stardom. And he was newly in love with the woman who would soon become his second wife. I never really thought that Rick would ever get seriously hurt in an Indy car. And I realized that that, that was being totally naive. Um, in September of 84 when he crushed both of his feet. In addition to the pain and the permanent disfigurement of his feet, Rick was sidelined at the height of his career. He spent three months in the hospital and a further six in a wheelchair. While others talked of his retirement, Chris never doubted he would drive again. Racing is Rick's first love. And it always has been, it always will be. And I know that Rick would be miserable without it, so... For that reason alone, I'm glad he's racing. Because he, I don't know what he'd do if he wasn't racing, and I don't think he does either. So far, Rick has not had to look to a life beyond racing. Recovered from his San Air crash, he has won Indianapolis twice in the last four years. He has often seemed to be beaten in the early laps, but then he has come from behind, calmly and deftly adjusting his car to suit the track conditions, just as he did when he raced in the desert so many years ago. The kid from Bakersfield has come a long way, but he has changed very little, except, that is, for the number of fingers he holds up in winner's circle. How soon will it be five? That is indie history waiting to be made by Rick Ravon Mears. Rick, a fractured foot, a fracture in your wrist, is that going to affect your drive and how? I don't think so. And I think it's this cool weather is, is a big plus. The new Marlboro car this year has a lot lighter steering than last, so that's really going to help the wrist. And uh, the foot, it's the left foot instead of the right, which is the one we don't use as much around here, so uh, we should be better, better shaped than last year. It's been six years since you've started a race here at Indy, not on the front row. How does that make you feel? Well, we'd much rather be up in the front row, but... Uh, you know, it's really, it's not different than any other race that we start back in the back a little bit farther. And, uh, you know, you just got to be heads up, you know, watch the traffic. We just want to get through the first lap or two and get comfortable and then go from there. Well, good luck to you. Thank you very much, Jack. Well, the tempo is beginning to quicken here on Pit Road as we draw closer to the start of the greatest spectacle in racing, the 76th running of the Indianapolis 500. We'll be back. Bobby Rahal, the 19... Remain standing and in silence. On this Memorial Day weekend, we pause here in a moment of silence to pay homage to those individuals who have given their lives unselfishly and unafraid to make it possible for us to witness as free men the world's greatest sporting event. We also pay homage to those men who have given their lives unselfishly and without fear to make racing the world's most spectacular spectator sport. Diamond Four Nation by the Black Aces of the U.S. Navy Fighter Squadron 41. 
Well, race fans, you know, during the month of May, we enjoy many very special moments here at the world's greatest race course. But here is one of the greatest traditions in the world, the annual singing of Back Home Again in Indiana. It's a privilege and an honor to introduce Mr. Jim Neighbors. Back home again in Indiana, and it seems that I can see the gleaming candlelight still burning bright through the sycamores. For me, the new moon hay. Through the fields I used to roam When I dream about the moonlight on the wall man, How I long for my Indiana home We to the head of the field, where the next words will be spoken. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the moment for the words we have been waiting to hear has arrived. And to give those words is Chairman Emeritus of the Board of Directors of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Mrs. Mary Hallman. Gentlemen, turn your engine. The engine start is a tense moment for each of these crews just before the start. The top of his engine. All the work done on the cars could be erased in a second. Each of these cars have been fully torn down during the past week and reassembled. It seems more common at Indianapolis than any other place that a car will fail to start, especially considering the crisp, cold day here. Lynn St. James, Mario Andretti all concentrate. There was much speculation over the nature of the command that might be given to start the engines as we look at pole sitter Roberto Guerrero. Considering, of course, Lynn St. James' presence, in the three times a woman has been in the field, Speedway officials have always arranged the command so that it would end with the words, gentlemen, start your engines, and they have done it once again. For old boy Sell, Eddie Cheever in the front row. Now on this crisp and cold day, the coldest we can remember, Al Unser Jr. They'll give the engines plenty of opportunity to come up in temperature and be ready to go. The first of the safety cars begin to pull away. And the front row starts to roll away. The second row, the third row, now the crews begin to clear off. Let's go Crackside and Gary Gerald. Well, Paul, we come over the two walls on the pit road, the practice, the qualifying, the apprehension, it's all over. One of the magic moments in sport, it's unlike anything else. The emotions run high. Chip Ganassi, he's got Eddie Cheever and Ari Leondike. What are your emotions right now? Gary, it's the biggest day in sports, and that's why I love this sport of auto racing. A great chance to win it. We wish you well. Thank you. Ford's going to win it today. We hope it's ours. The excitement is here, Paul. We're ready to go racing. Chip Ganassi has uh, two opportunities 
And we mentioned they had the calling off of John Paul's car, and the 93 machine had failed to start properly. It stalled when they started to roll away. Now John Paul Jr. talks it over with the crew, but very quickly they'll have to get it off of the starting field. They're going to try and hand start it. And it fires and they go, looking over Bobby Rahal's shoulder. The weather today at Indianapolis, the coldest in our memory, 51 degrees right now, a slight chance of showers, but the forecasters say the race should be able to be completed without any interference from the rain. Our Valvoline race analysis. We'll have plenty of summaries from Valvoline throughout the day to help you keep track of the 500 miles. They're on the back stretch. Moving very slowly now. There are some new pit rules for this race. Here's Jack Aroot. Paul, under the caution, this pit road area will be closed until the pace car picks up the field and they bunch up. They will do it by way of a board and a flashing beacon. Should you pull onto pit road during the closed session, you can pull straight through with no penalty. If you have a shredded tire or something like that, you'll also be allowed to pit. Now, here's the other part of the rule. What they're going to do is they're going to impose a 100 mile an hour speed limit during that closed pit and caution session. They'll measure it by radar guns. What will happen if you violate that? Well, the first time you'll be issued a warning, then possibly a fine, and then maybe a stop and go. It's going to mean a lot of congestion during caution periods here on pit road. Paul? It certainly caused a lot of discussion among crews and drivers here. Al Unser Jr. in the Gallmer chassis. What about the other chassis in this race? The Lola, the most favored. Many with Buick power prefer the 91 because it was designed for that. And the engines in the 76th running of the Indianapolis 500, that tremendous battle between Chevy, Buick, and Ford. We'll keep track of that throughout the day. And of all the starters in the field, there are the stats on those. $33 million have been won by this field. As now for the first time, the first of the three parade laps. The field comes in view of the main grandstand. Driving the pace car is Bobby Unser. Bobby, it rained last night. Has the track changed much? What's its condition? The conditions are good, Paul. The track is clean. Looks like the rain it might even help get a little bit of the rubber off of it. In my opinion, the track is going to be the fastest it's ever been at the start. It's very cold here today. How will that affect the tires? Well, it's going to affect the tires a little bit at the very, maybe like the first lap. But after that, it's going to be better on the tires. I think we're going to even see more speed because the tires being better today. Bobby brings the field through the short shoot. Bobby Unser, what about the cold with regard to the fuel injection system? It really won't affect much, Paul, because everything is fuel injection, computer controlled. That's going to make the difference. That's coming on the back straightaway now. We'll accelerate to about 130 miles an hour, and the Cadillac Elante is just a minute now. All right, Bobby, we'll let you pay attention to your very important job of bringing the field down. One car in trouble. The 36 car, unbelievable. Roberto Guerrero, the pole sitter, in trouble. No indication why this could have happened at all. We're only on the second parade lap, not even to the pace lap, and Roberto Guerrero spins the car. Talk about his bad luck here, Sam Posey. It's struck again. He has been on an emotional roller coaster throughout the month of May. Of course, he has not driven in cars, in racing cars, for almost a full year since he raced here. That's his wife, Katie, there. Of course, a look of disbelief. What could you be thinking at this point? They weren't even up to medium speed. It had to have been some incredible mechanical problem. You're looking at the team there of Kenny Bernstein. We're going to see him on the uh, middle of the screen there. Absolutely inexplicable. The only thing that one might consider, Bobby indicated to us, Bobby Unser, how cold it is. And because of that, look, the car is damaged. Yeah, no question, he's out of the race. The tires may not have come up to full temperature. And maybe with that high torque engine, when he shifted gears, just suddenly. Boy, it, uh... oh, what a terrible situation for Roberto Guerrero. One of the nicest men. We thought that he was making a true comeback. Of course, he was one of the uh, fastest and best drivers uh, in IndyCar racing in the mid-70s. He suffered a concussion uh, at this track in 1987 in a testing accident. He was in a coma for 17 days. And after that, and we're looking back now from the pace car, look, on to the, look at the right there, Roberto. Wow. He appears 
to have just turned suddenly, doesn't he, Paul? He I sure think does. car owners felt that he never had fully. This is Philippe Gash. Incredible. And this is Philippe Gash, who spun in the fourth turn. We're not even to the pace lap of this race. And that, now that we've had two of them, what do you think? The track is very cold. These tires must also be cold. That's possible, but I don't think that's what happened to Roberto. Now, of course, Philippe Gash is very inexperienced in open wheelers, cars with this kind of power, no prior experience. I talked to him just a couple of days ago, and I said, Philippe, what's the toughest thing that's happened to you all month? He said, I think the toughest thing is ahead of me, the start. He was very worried about this, and he had reason to be. Well, now the field will have to work its way around all of the vehicles that are attending to Roberto Guerrero and no doubt will delay the start of the Indianapolis 500 as Bobby Unzer takes the field around very, very slowly. So we'll keep track of this situation and we'll be back in just a moment. ABC Sports presentation of the Indianapolis 500. Brought to you by Chevrolet. The cars and trucks more people depend on. By Miller Genuine Draft, America's fastest going beer. By Goodyear, number one in tires. And by Gillette and the revolutionary Gillette Sensor Shaving System. Gillette, the best a man can get. Well, the field is forming up and beginning what we are told now will be the pace lap that they will go green next lap near tears Katie Guerrero her husband's car has been reported as too damaged to continue on a report from a driver further back in the field was that Roberto just suddenly accelerated perhaps going up to shift gears and then this happened the pole sitter at the Indianapolis 500 is out before the start of the race and Philippe Gash the number 44 car very much the same sort of situation I would say Sam yes certainly can suggest that the cold tires mated with over 700 horsepower as you're going up from second to third gear could produce that it is obviously devastating for Roberto Guerrero all right the field now moving down the back stretch the front row consisting only of two cars Philippe's still in the pits now. He started the engine, made it around, but they are checking his car. Now the pace picks up as they move into the third turn. Two cars in the front row. The rest of the field not well formed behind them. Moving through the fourth and final turn. A very different kind of start than we might have expected. A totally different scenario without Guerrero in there. Checking the onboard cameras as the pace begins to pick up now. They come off the fourth turn. The field accelerates. The green flag is out. And Eddie Fever moves to the front as the 76 running of Indy is underway. And look at Mario and Michael Andretti. They split and go around Eddie Fever. The Andrettis are in the lead. Well, the, that bit of feud between Cheever and the Andrettis, and boy, did the Andrettis take care of that feud in a hurry. Aerial bombs sound out overhead, indicating position of the cars on the track, and Michael Andretti is pulling away on the very first lap of the Indy 500. With conditions as they are, by the time his tires are up to temperature on the second lap, we are probably going to see a new lap record at Indianapolis coming up very fast here. His straightaway speeds in the 240 mile an hour range with his following win. And the first lap belongs to Michael Andretti. One and of there biggest... is Mario just behind. Eddie Cheever lies back in third. The difference, by the way, between Mario and Michael's car. Mario has a red rollover bar and a red number on his car. And at the moment, the difference is that one of them is going a great deal faster than the other. This is one of the biggest leads at the end of the first lap that we've seen in a long time. I talked to Penske designer Nigel Bennett just moments before the start. He said that the following win down the front straight is going to add 300 RPM to their speed there. That's the straightaway. You just saw it there. The Ganassi team now chases Mario Andretti. That's Ari Leyendijk that ducks under Mario into second place now. Interval first to second, about 12 seconds. Ari Leyendijk has the white rollover bar. 
then Mario, then just behind him, Eddie Cheever. So Ari Leyendijk is now in pursuit of Michael Andretti, the leader of the race. We have talked so much, you see Ari there, about the battle uh, among the engines. Right now, the Ford engines are one, two, three, four. There's no battle at all. They're running away with it. But of course, the race is very early in the going. And remember, the Ford engines were very fast in the final practice session. In fact, they were the fastest four cars. And they ran very well two weeks ago in cool conditions, just like this. Watching the fight now for second place. Battle for third. We're going to go back and take a look at the start of this race because it's settled down at the front of the field. And there he goes. Eddie Cheever makes his move forward, coming around Mario Andretti. But on the start itself, watch the two cars behind Cheever, Mario and Michael Andretti. Look at this. Have you ever seen anything like this before? No, I haven't. My guess is that Cheever missed a gear. He may have missed a shift up into fifth. The Andrettis, of course, we've talked about their feud with Cheever, and, and they have said that Cheever is unreliable at the start. But he drove, he kept his line there, and they both took a chance that he would. On board now with Rick Mears as he circles down into the first turn. You know, that incident at the start could very nearly have taken out another three cars, and the four fastest cars in this race could have been out of the race before the second lap began. In the older days here, the field used to bunch up a nice tight rectangle coming to the start. And had it happened in one of those situations, we would have had a, a very serious situation on the first lap. In qualifying, the difference between the fastest car in the race and the slowest. And another car slowing down. We are. We'll see if that brings out a yellow flag. Looks to be Eric Bachelor, the Indy Lights champion. Yeah. Very disappointing for the Dale Coyne team. Bachelor, in my view, was one of the two or three really good rookies. It's brought the yellow out. That car in a precarious position, so they decide to bring out the yellow at the Indianapolis 500. Michael Andretti maintains the lead. Sandy Andretti keeps track of her husband. The exciting Gillette Halfway Challenge is coming up in today's race. The Gillette Company, maker of the Gillette Sensor Shaving System and Right Guard Antiperspirant and Deodorant, is proud to bring you the Gillette Halfway Challenge. The Gillette Halfway Challenge awards the driver leading at the halfway lap $10,000. And stay tuned because a lucky fan who has entered the Gillette Halfway Challenge for the Indianapolis 500 will win a Chevrolet Corvette. And there is that new rule that Jack Root told you about, sign out. Of course, I don't think anybody would anticipate pitting this early in the race. But that sign posted out at the head of the pits, also some yellow lights flashing, saying that the pits are closed and they can't go into the pits without a penalty until that sign is pulled in. They would expect to make about seven pit stops during the course of the 500 miles, but certainly not one this early. So now the field slows under the control of the leader of the race and the pace car. Michael Andretti is the leader, followed by Ari Leyendijk, then Eddie Cheever, then Mario Andretti. Scott Brayton up in fifth. Gary Bettenhausen has jumped up to sixth place. Emerson Fittipaldi is seventh. Bobby Rahal is eighth. Danny Sullivan is ninth. And John Andretti is in tenth. Back at Indianapolis, nine laps complete. You ride with Danny Sullivan, the ninth place car in this race. Been a very busy first part of the race, including the parade laps. Let's get some updates now. First, uh, Mario Andretti make a, made a pit stop, didn't he, Jack? Jackaroo. Well, here's Mario, in fact, once again rolling down into the pitch. You can see he was in a few moments ago. They took the colling off. They indicated the engine was misfiring, and they sent him back out. I assume they sent him out so that he wouldn't lose a lap to the field, brought him around again, and now they can complete whatever work they have. And uh, perhaps we can talk with Jackaroo again. 
Paul, it's a mysterious malady they think somewhere in the electrics. They have already changed the electronic black box. Now, this problem actually took place right on the drop of the green flag. Mario radioed in that he had a slight misfire. They said, well, turn the boost down a bit to see if it was maybe a little too high in the boost area. That was not the case. They thought they'd have an advantage by under this caution period being able to make the exchange, but unfortunately that didn't work. Let's go further up pit road to Gary Gerald. Gary. And Jack, we're alongside Kenny Bernstein, who of course has the entry or had the double entry of Guerrero and Crawford in this race. Can you shed any light on what happened to Roberto on those pace laps? I really can't. Uh, when I got to talk to him, it was at the end of the conversation, the last sentence, he just said, I spun, there's some sus rear suspension damage. I don't know if something broke first or if it was wetness on the track or what happened. I just don't know. As a racer, do you ever get used to the likelihood of something that bizarre happening after all this buildup? No, you really don't. It's awful tough. I feel badly for the team and for Guerrero because I know how bad he feels right now. And they say that's part of racing, but you never get used to it. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Paul? Very disappointed man, Lynn St. James. 22nd position. Took it very careful on the start, which is just the way a rookie ought to handle it, right, Bobby? Yes, it certainly is, Paul. I was just going to mention something about Roberto Guerrero. I was on the pace car, kind of watching that in my rear view mirrors. And on his injectors, he has a mono valve injector, which is a single butterfly. I think what happened to him, they don't have any power until all of a sudden it hits because of the type of injector. And he was trying to get his tires warm because the track is cold. And he lit the thing, lit the tires up. Too much power all of a sudden, it's fun. All right, here's the way they lined up under yellow with 10 laps complete. As you take a look right square at Al Unser Jr. 10 tries, he's never won here, but he's been oh so close, 1989. Remember his contact with Fittipaldi on the second to last lap of the race. He's the only driver in the race to have finished in the top four in the last three years. The pace car now pulls off. Michael Andretti leads the field down as we go back up to racing speeds at the Indianapolis 500. Mario coming out of the pits as that slower car down on the warm-up lane as the rest of the field up to full speed. So Mario slides backwards in this field. His first pit stop took a minute 37. His second pit stop almost two and a half minutes. Jim Crawford trying to move up now. You got a glimpse of him in that bright green car, identical to the pole sitter. Emerson Fittipaldi trying to hold off Gary Bentonhausen. There's a matchup with Emerson Fittipaldi with the new Chevy B engine. Gary Bettenhausen has a Buick. And a car into the wall. A teammate of Gary Bettenhausen's. Another one of the Buicks out of the Menard stable. It's... That's Tom Stevens' car. Yeah. Former winner of the race. And the front end heavily damaged there. Steve, of course, living out in the Phoenix area developing golf courses and a new complex of baseball fields. Neva was trying to get out on his own. You saw him disconnect the steering wheel and pull it off. The front end of that car damaged so badly he could have some tanglement around his feet. Paul Reed and he couldn't get out right away. The fire that they had on the left was a small like oil type fire that wasn't going to go anywhere. But the big problem is going to be around his feet. Tom Sneva has crashed in five of his last seven Indy 500 starts. Yeah, incredibly, he has not finished at all since he won this race in 1983. And, of course, he continues that streak now. And you notice how the field, see, there's this debris all over the racetrack, and the field had to really come down. Look how close they are to the pit entrance. Single file. <laughs> A lot of them, I'm sure, said, oh, why don't you just let us go down through the pits? Let's look at this situation as it developed with Tom Sneva as we're under our second caution of the day. You can't help but think how close on the racetrack this happened to where Nelson Piquet also crashed. Look at the this. upper part of the screen. That is a crash almost identical to Piquet's, Paul, Bobby. Very, he, very close. Lost it at the apex. He just flat lost it. It was just the rear end came loose. I don't think anything broke on the car. It was just simple matter. Another angle, same situation. And you can watch. It's right, Paul, at the most likely place that a guy loses it at the very sharpest or the right down at the apex of the turn. Another look at the same accident from down right on top of the wall. Watch the yellow car. There it is. 
He did not hit directly head on, which is encouraging there. Uh, not as severe an impact as Piquet's was. The speed was lower and the angle was better. Let's have high hopes for Tom Sneva. So Tom Sneva loses control in the fourth turn, catches the wall on the outside, bringing on the second yellow light of the day. We'll return with more action from the Indy 500 after this message and a word from your ABC stations. Just moments ago, they removed Tom Sneva from his damaged car, and look at that. Tom Sneva waves to the crowd, and you can bet they cheered back. So a precautionary ride to the hospital, but the first report is that Tom Sneva's in good shape. Another angle of this accident. Sneva is one of 10 former winners in the race, and some of those men, including Sneva, have not had much experience lately and Bobby your brother Al told me you know when you haven't been driving a lot what uh, leaves you is your ability to handle the traffic whether that was part of the cause of this accident he was following other cars closely and there must have been a lot of turbulence taking air off that front wing well you can just see that the cars have so much adhesion and then all of a sudden they just bust loose Let's go down to the pitch. Jack Roots with Roberto Guerrero. Well, Paul, this is the first moment that Kenny Bernstein, the owner, had with Roberto Guerrero. He had just finally made his way back to the garage area. They've exchanged information. Roberto, share with us what happened out there. Well, I, I, keep, I keep hoping this is a dream or a nightmare, and I, I, I don't know if it is. You know, it, it was uh, uh, obviously with the cold weather, I was trying to warm the rear tires up, and uh, I gave it a little bit too much, and it just swapped into me. It's... Uh, it seemed like the the picture perfect month w that we had is the only the only mistake I made the whole the whole time a tiny little mistake and unfortunately it cost us the race. I mean I, I feel so bad for the whole Quaker State people, the Buick people, the the whole King Motorsports team. You know everybody worked so hard and you know being on the pole and we didn't even get to take the the green flag. It's uh, you know it's it's a tough one. I don't really know. What was the emotional feeling, though, when it happened, when that car snapped around? What was the feeling in the gut? Well, at that time, I was still hoping it was a nightmare and I was going to wake up, and that, that's all. I mean, obviously, very disappointed, but Roberto Guerrero will, will bounce back again. Time and time again, he does, Paul Page. He's had his downs, but he's had his ups as well. Back to you. Roberto has not finished an Indy 500 since he ran second in 1987. Mario Andretti is back in the pits. You're taking a look at the speedway from high over the track from Goodyear's Stars and Stripes with its bright new colors. It's symbolic of the new Goodyear under Chairman Stan Galt, who has engineered a turnaround at that company. The Goodyear Eagle radials on the race cars are also displaying a new look. Bright yellow lettering that says Goodyear is number one. Tom Sneva's car as they take it back to his garage, badly damaged. ABC Sports presentation of the Indianapolis 500. Brought to you by Miller Genuine Draft, America's fastest going beer. By Chevrolet, the cars and trucks more people depend on. By Valvoline, people who know use Valvoline. And by Prism, the only spray away car polish. Back at the 76th running of the Indianapolis 500, I'm Paul Page. We continue to circle under caution. So let's take this opportunity to show you what the drivers deal with in the cockpit. Here's Jack. When Ray Haroon was in the cockpit of this Marmon Wasp, on the way to victory in the first Indianapolis 500, he had to contend with some things that were pretty basic and sometimes quite primitive. He had the use of the rear view mirror, a shifting system that was mounted outboard and utilized an awkward system of clutch engaging and shifting of gears. When Ray came inside the car, he had to contend with 500 miles of turning the wheel, utilizing the brake on the left side and the gas pedal on the right side. He only had one gauge to concern himself with, and that was the oil pressure gauge for the Marmy. 81 years later, drivers are back to watching just one display that's located behind the detachable steering wheel. But this time, it's a sophisticated LCD computer display terminal, which gives to the driver all of the information that he may find useful in making adjustments to the car during the course of the race. Now, he also has a series of devices that he can adjust upon during the race to change the properties of the car. 
He wants to change the fuel mixture, he can move that device from lean to rich. He wants to add or decrease boost, he moves the boost knob. He can also change the handling capabilities of the car by stiffening or loosening the sway bars. There's a six-speed gearbox on board as well, and a driver can use the two top speeds to make adjustments on the car's gear ratio during the course of the race, depending upon track conditions. Now, each and every one of these adjustments, though, is assisted and sometimes dictated by what he reads on this display terminal. At speed, the dash processes over 2,000 information bits per second and becomes the driver's reference center. He instantly sees the effect of his line, position in traffic, and choice of gear. While RPM is the most watched display, an alarm system alerts the driver to impending problems, such as when his fuel tank is about to run dry. Guesswork is replaced by information processing. One wonders how old Ray would have handled today's technology. Well, all that great technology today, all that fine equipment, and you know what these drivers with their $350,000 cars would like to have right now, Bobby? A little bit of heat, a heater, the one item that's not in an Indy car. Many of them have radioed their crews and said it's very, very cold out here. Now let's get an update on Eddie Cheever. Here's Gary Gerald. We're in the Ganassi pits with Tom Anderson, who is monitoning Ari Leyendijk. Ari came in, Eddie came in. There was a difference in the stops. Tom, you Thank elected you. to have your driver change tires early. Why? Well, we just weren't sure how much of the incident that he may have come through, and uh, it didn't take really that much long, and I didn't want him running around with a piece of shrapnel from that accident. It'll lay in the tire, so all it was was an insurance. He's pretty happy with the car, and it looks like it's going to be a pretty good day. Okay, that's Leyendijk. Now, Cheever, we should point out, took on fuel, only didn't change tires. Any other adjustments to the car? No, none at all. He's happy. All right, let's check in with Jack Aroot. Well, Gary, I want to show you all of the things that Mario Andretti's crew changed on board his car. The black box, the ignition system, all of the spark plugs. And then they discovered what the problem was. It was the ignition wire itself. There was a short in it. They've made the exchange now. The report is that he's okay. All right, so perhaps both Mario and Michael will be in great shape for the race. That, uh, that looked like an awesome sign for those Ford engines for a moment. Yes, but uh, what they were unable to change in Mario's car is that black cloud that bad luck that seems to hang around uh, him here in Indianapolis. I can't believe he's been struck so fast in this race. Early trouble for the Buicks. Let's consider this. Roberto Guerrero, Buick Power goes out on the pace lap. Tom Sneva, Buick Power with the crash and Eric Bachelor out early. Now, when they come back to the restart, they should line up with Eddie Cheever in front. By the way, the first time he has ever led an IndyCar race. Coming up later today on ABC Sports, four of the world's top women golfers tee it up with the pressure mounting. The very first hole will be worth $115,000. Nancy Lopez had a great day yesterday. We'll have coverage right after the race of the J.C. Penney LPGA Skins Game as we continue today on ABC Sports. We expect to move up to racing speed once again. 19 laps are complete. Eddie Cheever leads Scott Brayton, who leads Michael Andretti. On a very crisp and cold day, Bobby Unzer, you've been here a little longer than I have. Do you remember a day this cold? Really, I don't, Bobby. It's the coldest day I've ever seen here. It's going to make the cars fast, but it's certainly cold right now for the drivers when they're going this slow. Temperatures in the low 50s. The green flag comes out once again, and Eddie Cheever is now challenged by Scott Brayton. And Michael comes to the inside. They're three abreast, heading for the first turn. And Michael wins the contest. Brayton slides into second place. Cheever is now fourth. There's a display of horsepower by the Buick with Scott Brayton at the wheel, but I should tell you the Buick, of course, is a six-cylinder engine, and only twice in racing history, including that first race back in 1911, has a six-cylinder engine managed to win this race. And if that's an indication of the matchup, then the Ford certainly outperformed the Buick going into that corner. Michael Andretti back to the front. He last led the opening last year in 1986. You could just see when he came down for the start how much confidence he had in his car because he went down with the tires being cold. The tires get right down to ambient temperature when they're running that slow. So when he went into turn one underneath them, he had fight to be for sure second place. The fight continues. Scott Brayton, Brayton holds him off, though. Scott Cheever Brayton tried it for a moment there. Scott Brayton, who you see currently running second but under a lot of pressure, has been consumed by this race. You see him trying to shake off the draft by moving to the inside of the Sorry, track. Sorry, comes almost down to the grass as he challenges his teammate and goes around Eddie Cheever. Now Ari Leyendijk takes a look at Scott Brayton. 
Well, you can see how important the drafting is because, boy, when they go down the road or down the track crooked, one guy goes to the left, they all just follow. Looks like a snake going down. Watch the drafting and you can see how important it is. The 22 been, car, Scott Brayton runs in second place. Yeah, he's been utterly consumed, this young man, by this race for many years. He's been in the race 10 times. This is his 11th start. Best he ever finished was six back three years ago. But last year, he briefly ran second, very deep in the race. You see him there, Scott Brayton from Coldwater, Michigan, nearby. Leader of the race, Michael Andretti, Ford Power. Can the engine hold on? This is its first 500-mile test. <laughs> Baldy, John Andretti is chasing him. We'll let the rest of the field come through, give you an idea of the position of these cars. One of the things we want to watch as you go on it, watch the different grooves that the cars take, the different cars. And that's all the way they have their chassis handling, which is how the drivers like them to be. Some of them go clear down to the grass, some of them go halfway across the white line at the apex of the turn. Some of them will stay out above the white line, Paul. Running in third, Ari Leyendijk. His first drive of this season. He won two mile races last year and then suddenly hit the unemployment line when Vince Granatelli folded his operation over the winter. Chip Ganassi gave him this opportunity in Indianapolis. We hope you'll see others throughout the year. It seems incredible that a driver of Lion Dyke's talent, and remember he won the race here two years ago and was third here last year, could come up without a ride. But luckily, at the last minute, he did get a ride. A ride which, incidentally, is sort of resented by the Andretti's because Here's Lyondike with a Ford engine, the engine that they did a great deal of the development on. And I think there was some jealousy, and if he succeeds and they don't, there'll be even more jealousy behind the scenes, of course. You're watching the battle for second, third, and fourth. The white roll bar car is Ari Lyondike as he tries to close down on Brayton, but Eddie Cheever is closing down quickly on Lyondike now. Yes, and he here is. comes Eddie Cheever. He's going to try him to the inside, Bobby. And he's going to make it. He got a good draft, and he just went right on by. But watch. Lion, or, uh, Lion Dyke almost came right on back because that's how much the drafting helped. Good racing among teammates. You see that the minute one car gets by on the straight, the other unable to get good clean air to get a bite with those wings and under trays in the turn drops back a little bit in the turn. And with the cold air today, the wings are working so much better than they did before. Now the cars will have a little bit more drag to them because the air is heavy when it's cold. But by the same token, they stick better and the engines must have gained 10% power today as cold as it is. The leader is running at uh, 221 miles an hour, a little slower than I thought that time would be under the circumstances, but still, of course, very, very fast. Indianapolis 500 now, 26 laps old. Bobby Rahal. Getting back. Which is kind of a surprise. Now, uh, we do notice those clouds overhead. I need to explain something to you. The signal comes from this race car up to a helicopter orbiting over the track. Because of the very low ceiling today, the helicopter must be much lower. And because of that, the signal from time to time may not be as good as we normally have. But we'll keep track of it for you. Another thing that's going to be a little bit different now, with these clouds hanging over that you just mentioned, Paul, that's possible rain. So it means the guys are going to run as hard as they can early in the race, just, on, just in case of rain. Bobby Ray Hall runs an eight. Let's go to Jack Aroot. And Paul, Bobby Ray Hall has already begun to plan the finish of this race. He ran a set of tires when he came in. He took those tires off and told his crew, save them. They're good. We may use them at the end. Well, Ray Hall's race, of course, is going to be a conservative one because he doesn't have the speed in that Chevy engine combination. All right, let's get an update on uh, Tom Stevens' situation. Here is Jerry Punch. Dr. Henry Bach just walked out of the care center, and Hank, uh, what's the status on Tom Sneva? He's on his way to Methodist Hospital. He has contusions to his left chest, his left hip, and both of his feet. However, he is awake and alert. That's good news. Tom Sneva, heavy impact with the wall, not nearly as bad as what we saw with Nelson Piquet early in the month. Paul? We wish Tom well. Tremendous medical center here. The leader of the race, Michael Andretti, as he now works his way through traffic. Consider this possibility. Could Michael Andretti get a lap on the field? He's moving much faster than anyone else. He's four seconds up right now on the second place car. I imagine, and I talked to him at some length, you see how fast he's running right there, courtesy of Valvoline. 
Yeah, I talked to him about this race, and I think that he has every intention of going hard right off the bat to see if he could get that lap on the field. And then, of course, he could back off and cruise it home. He has a very clear idea of what it takes to win this race. 220 miles an hour for the leader of the race. As we watch the rest of the field come through here, substantially slower than the over 230 mile an hour run that we saw for qualifying. The Indianapolis 500 is 29 laps old. Back at the Indianapolis 500, I'm Paul Page. We're watching a battle now, really for sixth, seventh, and eighth. Starting back in 33rd after the first lap yellow, Scott Goodyear has charged up to sixth place. You're on board with Bobby Rahal. And he's begun a battle now with Gary Bentonhausen and John Andretti. You see all four of them there. That's Scott Goodyear in the blue and silver car just in the front of that group. Tremendous fight. Here they come. There's Scott. There's Bentonhausen. And Ray Hall just moves around John Andretti. Yes, he certainly is. Well, you know, I've been talking them just a little bit right now. They're running awfully slow. Traffic is having an awful lot to do with it. But you look how low they're running on the racetrack. The racetrack has gotten slippery. Probably a lot of fuels or liquids have been lost on the racetrack. I'll tell you what, though, young Scott Goodyear is tough as look at Ray Hall as he comes inside Bettenhausen. Goodyear there in the silver and light blue car. On this cloudy day, a car a little bit hard to pick up. This awesome charge that he has put in, we can see it from Ray Hall's point of view. Ray Hall, as I said earlier, his long suit is going to be trying to finish the race with a car which theoretically has very reliable components. The leader of the race is Michael Andretti. He, by the way, is only about 12 seconds from passing the 13th place car of Rick Mears. But they're not communicating with Michael as they would like. Apparently, his two-way radio system has failed. And because of that, they are communicating solely in the old fashion with hand signals and pit boards to the leader of the race, Michael Andretti. And that's bad when that happens because it means all your information you get is basically like a lap old. Exciting pass by Ray Hall and there. Ray Hall inside. He took immediate advantage of that opening. As two cars peel off, including Scott, to head for the pits on this, the 37th lap in Indianapolis. Ray Hall slippery by Gary Bettenhausen as both Goodyear, Goodyear comes into the pits. So Scott Goodyear, Canadian driver who has been very, very strong, finally got a Chevy engine in his car. But he was quiet all month. We didn't hear much from him in qualifying. And as you said, he started the race on the very back row. Now this has been an astonishing performance. 16 seconds in and out for the Derek Walker directed team. And Scott Goodyear, from an excellent position, was up in sixth place. Green flag stop and goes back into the race. On the 32nd lap, A.J. Boyd went one lap behind the remainder of the race. He currently runs in 17th. But look at Michael. He just overhauled Danny Sullivan like he wasn't there. Sullivan told me that they're handling with the uh, Allen Burton-designed cars Galber cars is not good in traffic. And so I'm not surprised since he is in traffic here. Bobby, I see you have a thought on that, uh, that they had as much trouble there. Well, they thought that they were going to have a, a less of a loss in handling because it's cold, Sam. They thought they could run closer to the other cars. The big difference right there is horsepower. Well, that's the old engine against the new Ford. The new Ford is one powerful engine today. Rick Mir is the defending champion car number four. Runs in 12th place. Now you're on with the 86th winner, Bobby Rahal. Of course, when Scott Goodyear pulled out of that fight, it left Rahal to move up in position. Michael Andretti still 13 seconds in front. Many of the drivers are intimidated by the Indianapolis 500, but we asked Michael Andretti. He said he's not obsessed with Indy at all. Well, I think probably a lot of it has to do with, you know, the dad's results here, you know, in the past. And I can see where Al would look at it a different way because his family has seven wins in, in life. 
my dad's got one win out of how many tries. So I think I look at it from the point of view that if I do win it, it's going to be a bonus on my career. But I don't want to wrap my whole career up in just this one race. You know, I, I'd just like to say that everything else that I've done, you know, has made me feel good. And, uh, you know, if I ever do win this, it would be great. But if not, well, it just wasn't meant to be. Well, Michael Andretti has just crossed the 100-mile lap. And he has just passed Rick Mears. He's got a very, very solid run going here. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Paul, Michael Andretti may have a slight problem with his radio, but what they have done now is they are all set as far as selection of tires. All they'll have to do is signal what set he wants. They've used set number 19. Set 13 is on the car right now, but look, they rate each of the sets. Now, like set 17 works good with full tanks running, but here's the set to watch for, okay? It is the one that says set number 22. Very nice set. Finish race with these. And However, if he's, have it well planned out. if he's having uh, radio problems, and we hear now that Michael is coming in, oh, exciting pass by Emerson That's Fittipaldi, Fittipaldi, Fittipaldi and Jimmy Vassar, the fastest rookie in the field. Michael rarely uses his radio. I mean, I understand, Jack, it's a key ingredient in the thing, but unlike both Emerson Fittipaldi and Rick Mears, the Penske drivers, who talk constantly on their radio, Michael hardly uses it. Of course, when Fittipaldi went around Vassar, he was putting him a lap down. Now yes. only the top 11 cars run on the leader lap. And Michael Andretti is looking very strong. Jack Aroon? Yeah, Sam, you're absolutely right. In fact, the crew is not at all concerned about the infrequent use of the radio, the problems they're having. Now, let me update you. He's coming in shortly. They are not going to make any changes to the car. A routine stop is scheduled. Many of the crews have started to lay out equipment for the arrival of their cars in the pits. We will watch for the leader, Michael Andretti. Jim Crawford's crew is laid out right now, expecting the arrival of Crawford's car, the lone vehicle in the Bernstein stable left. There's A.J. Foyt just off to the left there. Now we see Emerson Fittipaldi, who also has had a quiet month. His countryman, of course, Nelson P.K. You see the sign for Michael to come in in a lap. When Nelson Piquet was hurt, Emerson Fittipaldi has been going down to the hospital every night to be with his friend and countryman. Now the two Andretti's battle. Of course, Michael coming up to put a lap on his dad just before this round of pit stops. And his dad would let him pass right there. There's Jim Crawford just in the pit. He would let him pass him pretty easy because he realized that he's down. Jim Crawford makes a 15-second stop. He was running an eight when he came into the pits. By the way, Mario Andretti is running a full four laps off the lead of this race as Paul Tracy, the very first pit, driving for Roger Penske in 500-mile races this year. Boy, Tracy doesn't intend to make a mistake in this race if he can help it. Did you see how slowly he came into the pits? I think he's driving a very cautious and smart race. Alan Sue Jr. in as well as Rick Gallus' team goes to work on that car. And Rick Mears in the pits. The Penske operation, these are all looking very routine. Mears and are happening on the 45th lap. Mears has to be an unhappy camper at this point. Down a lap to Michael Andretti, his worst nightmare, the Andretti Ford. Lola combination is doing so well at showing the speed, and Mears is not showing speed that could bring him a fifth win. And here comes Michael, 15 and a half seconds to stop for Rick Mears. Jack Aroot waits for Michael Andretti. And as we told you before, it should be a normal pit stop, just changing four tires and taking on fuel. problem getting the vent hose in but that wasn't really a tough situation because they don't need it till the end of the fuel filling process they're completed and he is down and away in 15.3 seconds so michael andretti back into the fight a good view of his number there car number one in this case signifying the champion of indycar racing last year michael andretti is the defending indycar champion and he finished second in this race here last year well, Michael Andretti had 13 seconds lead coming into the pits. Scott Brayton rolls back out into the fight as well. Michael came into the pits because of his pit position as the leader of the race. Emerson Fittipaldi comes back into the fight. As other cars cycling through making their stops now. Here comes Danny Sullivan as he rolls back up to speed and down into his pit area. Watching all of them on this situation they because we're under green flag let's let's cover this stop first jerry 
Routine pit stop in the Eddie Cheever pit, but Cheever having trouble seeing. He pulled a tearaway off, but he asked for his visor to be wiped. He said a minute ago he was sprayed by oil when he came by the Scott Pruitt car. He's complaining to USAC. They didn't have time to wipe the visor, but the front of his helmet totally covered in oil. Paul? So Cheever comes out. Raul Boisel was right behind him. Remember, under the green flag, there is no speed limit in the pits. We'll return with more action from Indy after this message and a word from your ABC station. Michael Andretti is still the leader of this race. In second place, it's Eddie Cheever. Third place is Scott Brayton. In fourth place, Ari Leyendijk. Emerson Fittipaldi runs in fifth place. As we take a look at the top of the order, second half of the top ten, Ray Hall, Little Al, Scott Goodyear, Jim Crawford moving up through the field now, and Paul Tracy driving for Roger Penske. Interesting that he is ahead of Rick Mears. Tracy is having a very good run for himself right now. Well, that now shows you sometimes the older cars are better than the new ones. I guess all we can see right there. Good place to start, Paul. The leaders at Indianapolis now find themselves having to thread their way through traffic. Some other drivers to keep track of. Lynn St. James, the number 90 car. He runs in 24th position right now. A.J. Foyt, by the way, is back in 29th place. Lynn St. James, St. James, incidentally, uh, we see Philip Gash there, the Frenchman who lives in Cannes in the uh, summer down on the Riviera and then withdraws to Chamonix uh, for skiing in the winter. Talked to him the other day, he's a marvelous man, I think with a big future here, Philip Gash. Gary Bentonhausen on the 48th lap came into the pits while we were away and when he did so, he stalled the engine in the pits about 33 seconds, but they got it started. We're seeing Lynn St. James here now. She adopted that name, St. James. She just liked it, having enjoyed watching the actress Susan St. James on TV. And last Wednesday night, we've got Somebody a with an engine, engine go. there headed into the pits. Makes it down into the pits. Hard to tell from this angle who it is. Well, I don't Looks think like it's Scott. Yep. Uh, Scott, Scott Pruitt. Then Lux Scott Pruitt. Boy, that Shows you with an engine where there's most that much. The engine really blew. He really ventilated that. Uh, from behind, you can kind of see that air intake that's on the right side, unlike the other cars. Scott Pruitt, the True Sports car, made in America development. They run the figures on this car uh, constantly at the uh, Ohio State University wind tunnel. And remember that Eddie Cheever was complaining that there was some sort of display smoke moisture oil at the back of this car earlier on well it won't be a problem any longer you that, saw some uh, that intake on the side of the car is ram air what it does is it rams the air into the turbocharger so the turbocharger doesn't have to work as hard therefore it gets a little bit more horsepower that way i saw some concern there on the face of sandy andretti and carl haas uh, who was smoking that cigar or at least had it clamped in his teeth stood up they of course associate with michael andretti the fight for third place. Scott Brayton now being challenged by Ari Leyendijk. Ari cries the inside. And what about Scotty Brayton? Gary Terrell, do you have an update? Obviously, Paul, in the running in the top three, they're very happy. They did make a change on that last stop. They put in just a little half turn on the front wing. He's got a little bit of a push condition. So we're at that stage where the drivers now try to chase the racetrack a little bit. But Dick Simon and company are really happy at this performance by Scott Brayton in the Buick. Scott Brayton looking very strong as Michael Andretti continues to claw his way up through the field. And you see him there. Saw him make a try a second ago on Emerson Fittipaldi to try to put Fittipaldi a lap down. Remember, Michael led the most laps in last year's race. And Michael led 97 of them. So if he can get around Fittipaldi, then there will only be four cars on the lead lap. And of course, three of those will have Ford engines and one of them a Buick. Chevrolets and the new Chevrolet engine we're seeing in Fittipaldi's car not showing speed at this point. You notice how close that Michael came to the wall as he exited turn four. He's driving every inch of this track. A lot, what happens there, Paul, is if you notice the track is slippery, the guys are all going clear down to the grass. And the guy behind, like right here, you see uh, Lion Dyke right behind. If he were behind that, right going to the turn like that, you can't get any air to his wings. 
And so they come close to the wall coming off. Landyke still trying to work. Scott Brayton Whoa, on their way oh, down no. in the fourth turn. Uses that extra advantage of the track. Beautiful and he gets pass. by Brayton. But look, now here comes Fittipaldi as well. And there goes Michael. So Brayton, boy, once he got past, he got stunned by it. I wonder if something's wrong on that car. Well, there is something wrong. He's slowing down too much. He's bogging everybody down behind him. About Jer the same. Jerry Punch, you have an update on Scott? Actually, on Ari Leindyke, Paul Leindyke has radioed in the three times in the past three laps, saying he has a vibration in the left rear that's getting worse and worse. They're concerned to have him look at the tire. They may have a tire going down. They are very, very concerned here in the Ganassi pit. And Fittipaldi grabs Leindyke and moves around. It scares you to death when you've got something wrong with the car, like a tire problem, and you're in close traffic with cars that you're dicing with for position. The big fear. The vibration in the rear like that is the CV joint. The axle back there might be going bad. The tire's shaking a little bit. If they're sure that's it, wouldn't bother them so bad. But if that CV joint goes back, remember, the rear ends on these things are solid axles from right to left. If one of them breaks, it's an absolute wreck. In traffic, Michael Andretti is turning laps at 220.7 miles an hour. The interval first to second is now 31 seconds. This race is being run away with at this point by Michael Andretti. When you think back to last year, he was a dominant factor here then, too. Had it not been for the mastery, you see his wife there, had it not been for the mastery of Rick Mears, I think Michael Andretti would have handily won this race. John Andretti in the pits as they uh, do extensive work. They're removing the front wings of the car, Bobby. Yes, they are. He's got, he's got the major repairs going to be made there, and it's going to be terrible time-consuming. Wonder what caused that. He must have gotten into some debris or something. Yeah, this is a cruel blow for John Andretti because his intention was to run a conservative race, hoping to stay in the top ten in the early going and move up into the fourth or fifth at the end. Now Michael Andretti tries to overhaul Gary Bettenhausen and put him yet a lap down as Michael just is carving his way up through this field and dominating the race as we take a look at the Valvoline race summary with Michael Andretti leading the most of the first quarter of this race. Average speed has been down because of the caution period, and there are still 30 cars in the Indianapolis 500. And with that maneuver, Gary Bettenhausen now goes two laps down. That's kind of telling us about the Buick engine. They're not whoa, doing... Whoa, whoa, whoa. And there another engine lets go. That's... Gordon Johncock, the 1982 and 73 winner. I just so the yellow it. flag comes out once again. Gordon Johncock with the engine letting go in a very big way. And he pulls down quickly to get off of the racing line. And that engine is definitely done. Once again, the Gillette Halfway Challenge is coming up in today's race. The Gillette Company, maker of the Gillette Sensor Shaving System, the revolutionary razor that adjusts to the contours of your face, and Right Guard Antiperspirant Deodorant for maximum protection against wetness and odor, is pleased to sponsor this exciting Gillette Halfway Challenge. The Gillette Halfway Challenge awards the driver leading at the halfway lap $10,000. And stay tuned because a lucky fan who has entered the Gillette Halfway Challenge for the Indianapolis 500 will win a Chevrolet Corvette. So with the caution out, Michael Andretti is still the leader. He's 29 seconds ahead of the second place car of Eddie Cheever. Fittipaldi is third a lap down, as is Ari Leondike and Scott Brayton. ABC Sports presentation of the Indianapolis 500. Brought to you by Chevrolet, the cars and trucks more people depend on. By Goodyear, number one in tires. By Norelco patented lift and cut shavers, we make close comfortable. And by Valvoline, people who know use Valvoline. Back at the Indianapolis 500, still under caution. Now with 64 laps complete, watch Michael Andretti, the last car. Look at how he drove that corner right out to the wall. An entirely different line than everybody else. Boy, he didn't drive it there, Paul. He slid out there. What happened is he had bad air. Watch that. See, he got his air from, from Memo there, from, uh, from Memo, just ruined his front wings. All right, let's go to the pits and Jerry Punch. Tom Anderson, the team manager for Ari Leindyke, still showing quite a bit of concern. Now, Leindyke made an opportunity to come on pit road. They did not change tires. They just added fuel only. The vibration still continues. Leindyke has complained. They are hoping, and they really are hoping, that it's just simply a wheel weight off and not a CV joint or something more severe. Let's go up pit road to Gary Gerald. 
medical attendants are taking Ted Bidding, a crew member for John Andretti, in for emergency treatment. He suffered an injury to his lower right leg or foot. It happened when John Andretti came into the pits too hot. He hit a tire, scraped the wall. That's what damaged that suspension that we saw on the left front. They replaced the suspension. He's back on the track. Paul? All right, so now we understand why John Andretti was in the pits with uh, so much repair being done to his car. Michael Andretti is still the leader of the race. Eddie Cheever in second. Emerson Fittipaldi is third. Ari Leyendijk is fourth. Ray Hall is fifth. Scott Brayton is down to sixth now. Al Unser Jr. is up to seventh. Scott Goodyear is eighth. Paul Tracy is ninth. And Rick Mears is tenth as the green flag comes out once again. Only three cars remain on the lead lap. Michael Andretti, Eddie Cheever, and Emerson Fittipaldi after a round of stops under the yellow flag. 66 laps complete. We approach the halfway point in the Indy 500. People will look and say, well, Michael has this big lead. Things must be going awfully easy for him. But he has gotten the big lead by taking... And an accident. Whoa. Two cars involved. Well, there was an unavoidable crash. The car and a dash as he waves and says he's okay, but a second car got into that as he was spinning. Look at that. Boy, like three it everywhere. A, like it for a couple of feet, that boy could have been very unlucky, Philip Gash, because the car that went by him, which I didn't get the number yet, he went by so fast, Paul, but boy, could have hit him right in the center there. Now, there's an interesting part of that rule that says the pits are closed. Somebody's hit him. He's got to have some damage. The chief steward, Tom Benford, said, now, if you really have a shredded tire or something and you have to come in, then you can do it without penalty. But I wonder how they're going to call this one. The car that hit him is going to have a lot of damage, I promise you, because he got hit pretty hard, Paul. So the rescue crews are already there. We are under yellow once again. And the pits, of, clo of course, are closed, and no one yet has headed into the pits. Here's Gash, an inexperienced rookie. He knew the race was going to be tough. He can't have He's guessed okay, it would though. be this tough. That's not Gash getting out. No, that's... That's Fox. So down Dan the track, that must, be the the, that must be the other car. Yes, there's the answer. I'm glad to see Stan is okay. He's a oh. marvelous midget sprint car driver. You see the damage to the front right and he's of laughing car. about it. Look at him. The right front of his car where it caught Gash is badly damaged. Now watch this. Watch this, Bobby. There's the spin. Gash. Philippe catches the wall. Oh. And Stan had oh. nowhere to go. It, wow. It, it, oh. Stan, Stan was almost into a spin himself trying to miss him. There was nothing he could do, but I can't imagine how lucky that Stan Fox and Gash are that he didn't plug him right in the middle. Yeah. Watch this Another now. Oh. Watch this. Doesn't show it as good there, but he was in a drift trying to go to the left to miss him. Very close. You know, that's a very unusual situation. You seldom see that kind of accident where one car is spinning and another car catches him anymore at Indy. Again, though, you see the components of the car tearing off and absorbing energy. Plus, when all, look at that tire and the parts going across. Often a driver behind doesn't know which one to try to miss. The rule at Indy used to be that you point at the car and then you'll miss it. Is that true anymore, Bobby? Yep. And there's Stan Fox as they take him back and we take a look at how the leaders are arranged after 67 laps still under the yellow. In trying to determine the most difficult back-to-back -back wins in major sports, there are many candidates. Reggie Jackson powered the Yankees to World Series wins in 77 and 78. Curtis Strange conquered the U.S. Open in 88 and 89. Wayne Gretzky and the Oilers claimed the Stanley Cup in 86 and 87. Joe Montana took the 49ers to Super Bowl wins in 89 and 90. Isaiah Thomas and the Detroit Pistons won NBA titles in those same years. And Boris Becker was the king of Wimbledon in 85 and 86. But here at Indy, it's been more than 20 years since Al Unser won back-to-back -back 500s in 1970 and 71. Back in Indianapolis, Philippe Gash, obviously conscious there, removed from his race car, talking with his rescuers as they load him in the uh, ambulance. You've got a view there of Stan Fox, his picture, who was also involved in this accident. Here's another view of it. Gash loses control in the corner, slaps the wall. Now keep an eye on his car, Stan Fox. Pinched off by another car, fails to miss Gash's car. Stan Fox is also out of the race. 
Looking at it from one more angle, Bobby. You know, one of the things that happens as you watch it, there's Gush out there hitting. Here comes the tires and the debris across. There's Dan Fox right there. You know, sometimes they don't know which to go for, the tire or the car. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. Well, Scott Pruitt has patiently been waiting here for a moment. A blown engine puts you out of this day. It's always a bitter, bitter disappointment. Was there any indication that it was going to be that kind of a day for you, Scott? Well, no indication to start out with, but but the last about the last five laps, we were having overheating problems. We think we may have lost some sort of water pump because the temp would go way up, come way down, up and down, up and down. So, you know, I just feel bad that, you know, after this whole long race that, you know, to come up come up short and end like this and everybody works so hard on the Budweiser two sports team that, you know, you just come away really disappointed. How difficult for drivers today in this cold weather after all of the heat of the past 10 days? Well, I mean, because the weather conditions have been so up and down, we had a fairly good handle knowing that we were going to have to run a little bit, a little less wing in the front because the car would get loose. We started out the race. Wasn't quite right. First off, we made some changes, and my car was real good. So uh, it's just unfortunate we couldn't play out the whole race. We'll see you in a couple of weeks in Detroit. You got it. Thanks. All right, let's go to Jack Aroot. Gary, let's update you on that mysterious radio problem with Michael Andretti. Michael's never had a problem with his radio. Here's what happened. They had a spotter up in one of the suites, and he had the key down. He had the key depressed on his radio. Once they got to him, everything's fine. Now, let's also update you on the Ari Leyendijk situation. You heard us talk about CV joints. They're a constant velocity joint that it's the end of each axle. They move. It also provides the power back to the wheels. And as Bobby Unser alluded to, you don't want one of those to go out at 226 miles an hour. Now the whole axle will spin around and cut the suspension off the rear of the car. Michael Andretti still leads the Indianapolis 500. We'll return after this message and a word from our ABC stations. the Indianapolis 500 Lynn St. James makes a pit stop under yellow very carefully they're taking their time with this stop her objective we're all sure he is simply to fare well in this race she's not racing to win that's not the objective of a rookie though occasionally rookies have won and Lynn St. James taking her time rolls back into the action she's under yellow she can take all the time she wants but how did Lynn St. James get interested in racing to begin with Well, when I was a teenager, cars became a fascination because my, my friends, which were my boyfriends, but not boyfriends, but the guys that were my, I was buddies with, um, they were all into cars. And so I was either handing them a screwdriver you know, so I could start the engine, or, which is usually the way it was. I mean, it was like, you know, really, these were not always neat cars, you know, but we, to keep the cars going. And we used to cruise around town. And, and I remember um, in those days, on Sundays, all the stores were closed. And in the wintertime, we used to go out in the big parking lot there at Kmart and do donuts in the, you know, in the parking lot. And so it was kind of, there was an escape, I think, about racing. And there was also, it was just a lot of fun. I mean, it was just something that was really fun and, and going to the races was fun so that became an element but I strictly as a spectator most of the time except for a few times when I mouthed off and they let me drive you know but I was the girl you know so it was it would but it was okay I mean I was just part of that world though that made I was comfortable when I was in that world when I was at the with the guys either at the races or or just hanging out and doing things with the cars I was comfortable I, I realized that that I was comfortable in that environment so Lynn St. James under the yellow. There's another rookie, the fastest rookie qualified, Jimmy Vassar, driving for Jimmy Hayhoe. Dennis Conner also has an interest in that car. We continue under yellow here. Michael Andretti continues to be the leader. He started this race ranked 27th in laps led at Indy. Now he's up to 20th, passing such great names as Lee Waller, Frank Lockhart, Jimmy Bryant, Tommy Milton, and Jimmy Murphy. Now, there are some changes here at the track this year, not just in the rules, but also on the physical plant. Here's Jack Aroot. In the past, we have witnessed some terrible crashes involving the end of the outside pit wall. As cars careened off the outside walls of the track, their forward motion carried them directly into the blunt end of the pit wall, resulting in devastating destruction and sometimes serious injury as well. Now, in an effort to reduce the exposure to accidents created by the pit entrance, Speedway officials shortened the outside pit wall over the winter by some 42 feet, and they also shifted the individual pits 
equally forward. Former driver Bill Simpson and his safety company worked over the winter months with Speedway officials to design a special crash absorption system that utilizes the same material that makes up the interior shell of every driver's helmet. Now the concept is that take different densities of that material and stack it forward of the concrete abutment with the idea in mind that a crashing car would have the energy of the crash itself absorbed by this material before the car reached the concrete. Now in case you're wondering what would happen if this system came into play during the course of the race, well the folks at Simpson have designed three additional units that can be quickly installed in this area. In fact they can go in in under 10 minutes. Jerry Punch is now with Stan Fox, who was in that accident. Jerry? Uh, Stan has just walked out of the medical center first. Stan, are you okay? Oh, I'm fine. Just uh, one of them unfortunate deals. You know, we just couldn't get her woed down in time. And uh, Tag Guy, I think it was Philip with my uh, right front, and just did a little slide along the grass. But I'm fine. Everything's okay. Good news from the hospital. We're getting set to go great, Paul. Good news for Stan Fox. We'll keep you advised on Philippe Gosh's situation. Michael Andretti will lead them back to the green. Then Eddie Cheever, Emerson Fittipaldi, Ari Leindyke, Bobby Ray Hall, Alan Sir Jr., Scott Brayton, Scott Goodyear, Paul Tracy is 9th, 10th is Jim Crawford, Rick Mears is 11th, and Al Unter is in 12th place, followed by Danny Sullivan, Raul Boisel, and Gary Bettenhausen. Pace car comes off. And Michael Andretti already anticipating the green flag, which flies, accelerates, and pulls away from the rest of the field. Boy, look at the advantage he got on that restart. Oh, he got a run at him clear back in turn three, Paul. He got about a two-city block head start on him there. For all intents and purposes, this is a one-man race right now. You saw a flash of what looked like smoke there for a second, and we've oh. got an accident. Several cars. Holy smokes. One of the Penske cars. It looks to be Fittipaldi. Emerson. It's Emerson, Emerson. Fittipaldi. Who tags had the been, wall right on that restart. Who'd been running third. He was one of two other cars on the same lap as Michael Andretti. Well, Emil had great fortune on the yellow. He was on the tail end of the lead lap, but was able to close up and get back into contention when the yellow came out. He looks to be all right. He's moving around in there an awful lot. The car doesn't look like it's been up all that bad, Paul. So I imagine Ammo should be able to get popped out unless he's got something sticking his legs in or holding him in, rather. What an unusual Indianapolis 500 this has become. The pole sitter, Roberto Guerrero, has his problem before the start of the race and tags the wall. We've seen an accident like we uh, haven't seen before between Gosh and Stan Fox. This is the view of this situation from Rick Mears on board camera. Mears had up ahead of steam. Whoa, Mears is going to be out of it, too. So Mears, it looks like, got involved with a Crawford car. Yep. Caught a good glimpse of that Both car Penske it came cars, around. Both Penske cars put out at the same instant. A single situation and two cars out and the second Bernstein car. Oh, and he was caught. There was absolutely no place to go. In other words, it just was a wedge right into the wall, plus into the green car of Crawford there also. Well, there is an example of when your number is up on this track, your number is up. There's just nowhere to hide on an oval with a big concrete wall around the outside of it. It looked as they came back to green. We saw a lot of dust coming up. The track, of course, they've run very hard on a lot of this track. Yeah. And there you see Emerson's problem. Emerson apparently got into some of the debris of that accident. Yeah, but I think he... Because, there's Roger Penske. Well, he suffered a tremendous loss in the past few seconds. Boy, yeah. I mean, that's it's, a lot of loss in just a short time, and you can look at Roger's face and see what his feelings now are. Now, take a look at it again. Okay, now, there's, there's the first impact, which involved Mears and Crawford, and, and there's fit Emerson fit, crashing at the top of the screen. And it would appear that Emma went down there and had a problem unrelated to the other. Incredible. Unless he ran over some debris. But he wasn't there high. yet. He wasn't at the scene of the accident yet. I don't think he could have been uh, running well, over well debris. Back. See? Look at that. There's impact number one, and now we're going to look at the now upper watch, right. Watch Fittipaldi running rather high. Yep. And comes yep. out from behind that other car. I think he may have just had to lift off really suddenly because of what he saw ahead. There's Rick Mears waving. He's going to be fine. Incredible. It's so far, knock on wood, we don't have a couple of vital reports. Everybody is getting away with what really amounts to automotive carnage. And that 
that dust that I mentioned that was part of the uh, oil dry that they put down on the track after the last accident. So that's not representative of what the rest of the track might be right like. Emerson Fittipaldi, as they help him, and he's sore, though he's obviously conscious and uh, awake. Penske's two million dollar warriors being carted off at exactly the same moment. I never thought I'd see this at the Speedway. Devastating. One turn, one lap, all at the same time as two stars. Emerson, I think he's hurt. Emo's uh, smiling, but no, uh, I don't. I don't think that was a smile. There. I, I yeah. really don't. Or I think he was. Yeah, grimace. I really think so. Now Fittipaldi is on the high side there. Watch them as they come out from behind the tree. Just starting to get in trouble there. On the low side, actually, down low. That's yep. what we meant. And catch the wall. Yep. Well, emmo has been spending a lot of time over at Methodist Hospital visiting his good friend Nelson Piquet, who we can report to you is improving, and we wish him well. Now, perhaps uh, Emerson Fittipaldi will be making a trip over to Methodist as well. The Hanna Emergency Medical Center here in the grounds, Mears and Fittipaldi both on their way there. We'll be back after this. ABC Sports presentation of the Indianapolis 500. Brought to you by Miller Lite. It's everything you want a beer to be. Miller Lite, it's it, and that's that. By Haviland Formula 3 Motor Oil. Add more light to your car. By Thompson's Wood Protector your best defense against water, sun, and mildew damage. And by A1 Steak Sauce. A1, it's how steak is done. We're back in Indianapolis, still under the caution, a three-car accident. Let's go to Jerry Punch. First rookie driver, Philippe Cash, has walked out of the care center. He was in an incident just moments ago, and Philippe, you looked to be okay. What happened out there? Uh... Yes, I'm okay first. Uh, I think I'm lucky because the crash was uh, uh, really hard. But I don't really know what happened. You know, guy in front of me breaks suddenly in turn one. So I was surprised and I was obliged to break also. And then I spawned and I heard the, the, the wall. And only two or three seconds after, a car hurt me again. But uh, I'm okay, you know, everything is okay. I'm just at that point. Philippe, you missed the green flag. What happened at the start? I had during the warm-up lap before the green flag I had the engine problem the engine was cutting running cutting running and then uh, instead of that I spun uh, in the first time and I go to the into the the pit to change the, the black box the electronic box and then it was okay but I was three laps uh, behind Philippe Cash okay here at the care center Paul oh boy that's that's great news and that shows the strength of these race cars designed into them of course, safety is a masterful concern always at the Speedway. Let's get an update from Jack Haroon. When Ray Haroon captured the first Indianapolis 500, the car reflected the automobile industry at the time. The Marmon Wasp, like its contemporaries, was a relatively new invention, and the concentration was upon ensuring that the car would withstand the test of 500 miles. Safety was a low priority. They were primitive, and more times than not, they failed. As the sport evolved, so did the cars. By the early 1950s, competitors were at the controls of an Indy Roadster, a vehicle built specifically for Indianapolis. Simply put, the Indy Roadsters were iron cars for iron men. They were built high off the ground. These monsters were welded together with enough steel to absorb the hardest of impacts. In a crash, the cars would spin, turn, toss about, and tumble. By the mid-70s, engines had moved to the rear of the car, and they were built lower to the ground. Side pods and aerodynamic tunnels were added for stability. Also, they added a wing. The key was to provide an envelope of survivability for the driver. Cars were built specifically to disintegrate in a crash, taking with each detached part a portion of the crash's energy. The concept was still in its infant state, though, and while drivers would survive, their bodies took a torturous beating. As we approach the 21st century, safety plays an equally important role with speed. Engineers have incorporated space-age materials like Kevlar and carbon fiber into their car designs. Driver position has been redefined so that they're encapsulated in an area called the tub. A crash at over 225 miles per hour makes one gasp. 
but thanks to high-tech computer design methods, space-age materials, and modern manufacturing techniques and applications, crashes that in the past would almost always severely injure a driver now find the driver better protected and in more cases than not, able to walk away. Still under yellow at Indianapolis as a result of the accident that took out the cars of Jim Crawford, Rick Mears, and Emerson Fittipaldi. Three very big names out of the Indy 500 in one situation. Now this was just moments ago. Dominic Dobson, the 68 car, the left rear was not firmly attached when he spun up, ready to roll out of the pits. No damage as a result of that, but boy, they had to get the car back around before anyone else got into that area and get a wheel back on it. Jack Aroot? Paul, you're looking at John Tassanagas, who's the fuel man for Mario Andretti. It seems when Mario came in, they had a problem with the right front brake caliper. They were working on that. It was an extended stop. They had two air wrenches over the wall, and they threw them back over the wall and hit Tassanagas in the right ankle. So the medical crew is working on him. Let's update you on Michael Andretti as well. He is extremely concerned that he may have run over debris in that accident while they were running under caution. They have been debating back and forth as to whether to bring him onto pit road. The crew has said, we want to leave you out. Michael has reluctantly, so far, said okay. But well, now, now we've been told he's going to come in in three laps. He's going to come in. So he's won the argument, fellas. Well, we're looking at the car, and of course, that would make sense to me to take uh, the word of the driver and what he's feeling in the car. Well, you know, the problem with that is, is the tire may not be cut, but it could get the pressure when he's in the, when he's in the turn. All right, Michael Andretti, under yellow, due to come into the pits, he wants his car checked over as we take a look through the running order at the completion of 70 laps. Anticipating a green flag now, which may have an adverse effect on Michael's plans to come into the pits as you ride with the younger Andretti. Yeah, this could be a decisive moment in the race. Pace car comes off onto the pit road. Michael begins to accelerate. He's not nearly as good a run off of the fourth turn as he got the last time as the green flag flies on the 82nd lap of the Indianapolis 500. And look at, oh, and another car, and that's Mario. This involves Mario Andretti. You see him moving over toward the pit wall on the inside. Mario Andretti. Well, that's been more like a war zone today than it has been a race. We hardly get the race started. We have another crash. Very lucky for Michael Andretti. This will bring out a yellow, which will enable him to take care of his tire problem. Well, remember, Sam, we don't know that he has one. Let's tell everybody that, but he's just worried that he may have, and often the tires don't give a problem until you're in the middle of the turn. Now watch this as we ride with Mario. Waiting for the green to come out. The field strung out through the third turn now. The short shoot is ahead. But you just don't want to know. You just don't want to look. Ken just came loose. Yo! Oh. Boy, that gives you an idea how hard they hit here. Back end just came loose, just like you just said, Paul. There was, I don't think anybody else involved or anything else involved. Sixth time that a crash has taken Mario out of the Indy 500. He's failed to finish in 20 of 27 Indy races. And it's at the same place that turn four coming off. It's got to be slippery up there because we've seen a lot of problems. There. And that was a, a fairly head-on angle into the wall. So we hope Mario is okay as we take a look at this situation again. This race has turned into a demo derby, basically. And yet, in a sense, it is also proof that today's technology in Indy cars can protect the driver. We've seen accident after accident without serious injury. It makes you wonder, why can't we have something like this for our passenger cars? I hope that in the next 10 or 15 years, the technology that we are seeing developed here at Indianapolis will start to be available widely for all of us who drive our families on the street. Well, it's been when he hit the wall. The cars that were running behind Mario all had to jog, jog around there, including Bobby Rahal. This is the in car in slow motion. Now watch his hands. He tries to correct it. 
Yeah. Now he remember knows. on a very knows. car that once it's gone sideways, you see, he quits working the steering wheel because once you've gone so far sideways, there's nothing left to do with the steering wheel. Just ride it out and hope for the best after that. And did you see him push his head back into the headrest just before he yes. to the wall? Yeah. And he, you don't get a whiplash. And pop he took precautions, that's for sure. That's the move of a veteran. Yeah. I bet he pulled his feet back in there, too. This view is right from the oh. wall that separates the main straight from the pits. Well, he hit that thing head on. I mean, it's bad. It has been seriously dangerous in turn four this year at Indianapolis. So a most unusual Indianapolis 500 is 84 laps old. Back in Indianapolis and still under the yellow been a very busy day six caution periods thus far Michael Andretti is the leader of the race Eddie Cheever is in second the only two cars still on the lead lap they've completed 85 laps there is Bobby Rahal he is down in fourth place Eddie what? Cheever of course is uh, going to have to hold off a charge by his own teammate Ari Leyendyke when we come back to the green flag because Ari will want to come up and fast and try to get on to the lead lap uh, and race with Cheever. Ray Hall, of course, has that Chevrolet engine, and only Ford engines are ahead of him. So the scenario which sees Ray Hall win as the other engines all break is in place right now. Bobby Ray Hall, the 1986 winner of the race, twice a champion in this series. We ask him why, with all your businesses, do you still race? Uh, must be love. <laughs> you know? uh, it's, uh, I do love it. You know, I think we've got to work to make the car safer. Uh, the circuit's safer, uh, but I don't, uh, you know, I don't want to leave the sport now. And it's if I have an obligation to myself, it's to make the sport safer, so that not only will I benefit from it, but those coming up. And uh, so, <clears throat> even though I could walk away from it right now, I really don't want to. I really love the sport. So Bobby Ray Hall, and we are still under yellow here, waiting for the green to come out. Scott Goodyear on the pit road. Ray Hall had his, his Rolex watch that he won when he won this race in 1986, stolen the other day from his apartment here. He ran out after the thieves, but didn't catch him. He needs another winner's Rolex. There's Big Al, who heads out after a stop under this caution period. The hope of the Bernard team now. You know, you mentioned Big Al. He is the last guy to execute a big runaway victory in this race. It happened back in 1970 when he... Uh, led a majority of the laps. Onboard camera still working on Mario's car, though the car is not after that accident in the fourth turn. It's on the hook being carried back through Gasoline Alley to Mario's garage. And a souvenir hunter <laughs> coming up, looking for just one small part off of the car. Well, Paul, it comes to mind on the problems with all these spins that we've had a, a not really a tire problem, but tires that are not really made to run on this colder racetrack. And I think these guys are well, they're taking off. They're finding out they just lose adhesion. There comes Michael into the pits. Everybody comes in right at the last before it goes green, so they can go the longest till the next stop. And right behind him, Cheever comes in as well. So this will be a battle of the pit crews as Michael's crew is ready for that car to arrive. Already, Eddie Cheever has rolled into his pit. Well, I'll tell you, they were both observing that 100-mile-an-hour speed limit. Do you notice how slow 100 miles an hour looks? Because you get so used to 200 miles an hour. There's Cheever making a good getaway while Michael's car is still stationary. Eddie Cheever now leading. So Eddie Cheever, with a quick stop, moves to the front. And Michael Andretti rolls out of the pits. Routine stop under the yellow, both very careful about the speed. But it sets up, for the first time today, the possibility of Michael having to battle for the lead. He's going to have to make a pass to regain the lead. First time he'll have to pass somebody in an honest way, you're saying. So <laughs> <laughs> instead of just lap cars. Our statistician, Greg Fielding, just pointed out to me that when Big Al, your brother, dominated this race back in 1970, he led 190 of the 200 laps. Nothing like that since then until now. Certainly makes the race easier when you do that. When you have to pass a lot of cars to race for the lead, it's a whole lot harder. Now, these cars are so similar. There is Cheever, who stayed out. That was Leyendyke that came in behind Michael Andretti. Yep. The only difference being a little white on the roll bar, and I was looking at it and wondering about it, especially I was wondering why they would do it that way. And Bobby. the white front wings, too. I got them to change but those yesterday. Why would... <laughs> 
Why would they do it that way? I, I guess because they've decided this car has much more fuel and big stay out there. Because Lion Dyke needs to stay out, get ahead of the two leaders ahead of him so he can get back in the same lap. Then you would have three Fords running one, two, three in the same lap. All right, there's been some question about the tire's ability to stick in this cold weather. Let's get an update from Jack Aroot. And, Paul, with me is the director of racing worldwide for Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Leo, a lot of people are saying that the tires have not got the adhesion that they'd like to have. Is that due to the weather? Well, if you have a cold track on a cold day and you spent the whole month running in 80 degrees temperature, you have to be very cautious on the first lap or two. And, and I think... And I think the tires are fine, but they just have to be very cautious coming out of the pits. Well, that's important as we watch Eddie Cheever, your leader, being taking on its tires and fuel. And one of the things there, Leo, there was a talk about a vibration. We just received a report from Jim Ganassi that it was simply a wheel weight and they don't have a problem anyway. There's not anything that Goodyear can do about the weather, is there? No, I mean, we're prepared for a cold day or a hot day. We're not blistered any tires. They're wearing great. We're happy with them. The guys just got to be careful getting out of the pits. I don't think you can say any more than that, guys. Well, in my memory here, it stretches back to uh, 1960, and I don't remember a day nearly as cold as this. Believe it or not, when I asked the Goodyear engineers what difference uh, the tires are, what is different about the tires this year than last, they said, well, they're rounder. Isn't that a, a strange well, thing? Well, the thing about it is, it, it's so rare that you have a cold day like this, and they can't make tires that will work really cold and still work good if it's really hot. And if it's really hot, they blister all the time if they're not working right, so then they get knocked for that. So it's really not Goodyear's fault. So Michael Andretti still dominating the Indianapolis 500 as we are just 12 laps away now from the halfway point. And just so everybody knows, when the tires get warm after a few laps, you really don't have any more problems. The rubber just needs to work itself and get some heat within itself, and then they're okay again. So it's, of course, right after all these restarts when right. it's cold. So in a sense, a crash is a self-fulfilling prophecy because, of course, it produces uh, the chance for another crash. And the pace they're begins up to pace. pick up now. The green flag comes out again. And once again, they're racing at the Indianapolis 500. Get a good view of the entire field as they come through. Now, Michael's way back in the pack right here, but he's actually way up in the race. These are the, all these cars that he's passing are lap cars, everybody knows. And you will see how much faster he is going, or I think you will. Well, Michael Andretti, the leader of the late race, there he is. For a second, I picked up the wrong car. Now take a look down through the field. That's Ari Leyendijk just in front of him. And Ari runs in sixth place. But during those stops, remember there were only two cars on the lead lap prior to the stop. A lot of people caught up on that situation. So now all the way down to sixth place. And that means that Fever is uh, in there as well as Raul Boisel. I'll tell you, Brayton, they all got, to, got their laps back. This is an ideal situation for Michael Andretti. He is probably the hottest, fastest, loosest, best driver of right today. And the fact that the track is so tricky only plays into his hands. Let's go to the uh, pits once again. Jerry Punch is with Rick Mears' dad. Bill Mears, you just were inside talking with Rick. What's the story on Rick? How's he feeling? He's okay. He's not hurt hardly at all. His feet's okay and everything. How about Emerson, Fittipaldi, or Crawford? They were all in the same incident. I, I didn't really check. Uh, they were in another room, so I don't know. But I just went in and looked at Rick. He's okay, and they're going down. Just check him over and say, be back in a little while. So we're happy. So they are going to take Rick Mears down to Methodist for some x-ray. That is good news as far as all the Mears fans are concerned. Paul? There's his mom, Skip, as well, that comes up. They both were able to go back to the medical center. Well, the numerology suggested Rick couldn't win his fifth this year because uh, the t spacing between his wins just wasn't right, and he started from ninth on the grid where no one has ever won from. You know, I was wondering about that, though, because Danny Sullivan started on the same position that he actually won this race on, eighth position, but then when the pole sitter goes out, Sam, before the start, what does, does that, that mean? change everything? <laughs> the statisticians will have to uh, worry about that one. Now, Michael Andretti continues to perform flawlessly in the Indy 500. He's now taken that engine further in the lead than it has raced at any time thus far this season in the first two races of the season which run only about 200 miles. He's now approaching 250 miles. And there on the left of the screen in that black car is Bobby Rahal. And remember, a great many knowledgeable people in this sport picked Rahal, thinking that the Ford engines and the Buicks would fail along the way. Rahal knew what he had to do to be the, so to speak, winner of the Chevrolet 
part of this race, and he is leading of all the non-Ford engine cars right now. Now Bobby Rahal runs in third place. He is challenged from behind by Scott Brayton. And they're running laps at some great speeds. Boy, Ray Leader of the race, Michael, has been up above 220 consistently since the start of the race. Whoa. And there goes Scott Brayton with the motor letting go. Yeah, I hate to say this, Paul, but Buick has just had problems now, today. Now, a lot of these Buick engines, just so everybody knows, have not all been built by Buick. They've been by, built by different people that Buick allows to build them. So they're not all the same problem, or at least they shouldn't be. They have different types of injectors on them, different camshafts in them, a lot of different concepts concept in these Buick engines. But boy, right there, pretty vivid example of what happens when you get into a sport with an engine because it can blow up right in front of everybody. So Scott Brayton will fail to finish. Now his eighth failure to finish in 11 Indy 500. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. This is the network television debut of Goodyear's newest blimp, Stars and Stripes, which was christened on Good Morning America recently. It's piloted today by Larry Chambers. There it is. Beautiful machine. Giving us some great shots from high overhead. We anticipate a green flag shortly. Look at the Buicks. We started the race with 12. Only five are left. Guerrero, Bachelard, Steve Fox, John Cack Crawford, and Brayton. All by the wayside, though not all due to engine failure. Some accidents involved in that as well. The last, of course, Brayton, as the green flag comes out, and you watch Michael Andretti work the five-eighths of a mile straight away at Indianapolis. And just that fast, the five-eighths of a mile are gone. Into the short shoot at the south end of the track. And look how he pulls away from the rest of the field, right up to the green. You never saw anybody else in the shot. Michael Andretti, a tremendous run. And Paul Tracy, apparently in trouble. The last Penske car, and another car into the wall. Another car into the wall. Vassar. Jim Jimmy Vassar. Vassar. Wow. One of the really top rookies in this field, a man with a big future. Yeah, you would think by now, with the problems that these drivers are having, and they see the other guys have with their cold tires, after these restarts, they'd go a little bit easier, Paul. Like, you know, I, I, they may not understand what's happening. Isn't All that the kind of thing that, that they would go up and down the pits and tell everybody to be concerned with, Bobby? They see this all around the track, believe me. All right, let's go down to the pits, Gary Gerald. Well, we're down here in a bit of a traffic jam, and Scott yeah. Brayton is out of the cockpit. You were running so good, but it just didn't run long enough, and that's a familiar theme, unfortunately. Well, you know, it, it is and it isn't. There's been a lot of cars and engines that have gone out so far, but really I think what happened to us, Gary, is that the temperature's so cold out there right now, and with the immense amount of yellows we're having, which we didn't anticipate, we're having a hard time getting temperature in the motor. So when you're coming up and off, uh, of boost it's real it's a big temperature cycle on the engine and so i you know i don't know if that's what did it but uh, i was trying real hard to get around ray hall there at the end and i'm sure i had some strong numbers at the end of the straightaway with drafts what about all of the incidents has that been a problem of temperature with tires well it, it hasn't been a big uh, problem with tire temperatures because the tires goodyear's done a really great job they're gripping real good i had one stint in there where it was a little bit uh loose and it was, you know, I had to make adjustment on the car, but that hasn't been a problem. Scott, let me slide back here. Here's Jim Wright of the Buick uh, Company. You've been working on these engines. I know that every year you, you make gains, Jim, but here you are again, not maybe to finish the 500 miles. Yeah, well, we've still got a few out there that we're hoping that will finish, but, you know, being that Scott is, you know, is a partner or is owner of the, the business, we, you know, you always pull for him too, but... Uh, we just got to go back and do some more work, it looks like. All right. It's an emotional, tough moment for these people. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Dr. Henry Bach had just come out of the care center here just a moment ago. Let's giving us a report on some of the list, the long list of drivers. Let's listen in. Uh, some report on his x-rays. Okay, Henry, uh, you just came out. You have a list of uh, injuries on certain drivers that have been brought in just moments ago. Tom Sneva has been released from Methodist Hospital in good condition. His x-rays were negative. Jim Crawford is going to Methodist, as is Rick Mears and Emerson Fittipaldi and Mario Andretti. Rick Mears sustained injuries to his left knee, and we'll get x-rays of that in his feet. Emerson Fittipaldi has a puncture wound to his left knee, and Mario Andretti has injury to both of his feet, 
the extent of we, what we won't know until we see his x-rays. So a lot of reports pending here from the Hanna Medical Center. Let's check into the pits with Jack Aroot. Jerry, I'm with one half of the ownership team of Bobby Rahal's car, Carl Hogan. And Carl, you guys have made a decision to keep Bobby out on hot tires. You come in, take fuel, but you want to keep the heat up, so you're going to use used tires. Yeah, well, first of all, we think part of the problem might be the cold tires. It's a cold track. The cars really haven't been able to get some, too much speed. The other problem we've got, of course, is that we're getting very little tire wear. So the tires are good. We'd rather send them out on the first lap with good tires. We think the grip will be good. Well, that's some good news. Let's update you, too. The concern early on about the Fords, whether they would be able to go the distance with the fuel available, all these cautions Ford engineers tell us have thrown those concerns out the window. They say they've got plenty of fuel till the end. Well, that's good news. Well, I don't think the, the Ford fuel. engines have had a problem with fuel in the beginning. There's only a couple of the Buicks with the mono valves. No, in fact, just the opposite on the Fords. They've been in pretty good shape. We look once again at the uh, situation that brought on our latest yellow. That was Vassar. Jimmy Vassar and caught the just, wall. And you can see, see the same problem. Exactly the same, same thing, isn't just it? Just loop yeah. adhesion. And, of course, the rear end's always the one that breaks the weight first. And it just likes, looks like a replay of almost every accident we've had today so far. We're hearing a lot of guys are getting hurt here. This is this is very bleak. Yeah, there's a, that's not a great list that uh, Dr. Bach gave us. There is Vassar. Yeah. Just a one car right down in the apex. Thing. Very fortunate. That was almost a two car right there, yeah, Sam. Yeah, you bet. Sure was. John Andretti missing him by inches. Remember, they did a lot of work on John Andretti's car to get him back in the action. Here yeah. is the view across the short shoot. damage to the right side of that car. Let's go down to the pits. Gary Gerald is with Rick Gallus. Rick Gallus, this is turning out to be a most unusual Indianapolis 500, but right now you're one of those teams where this race is coming into your hands. Well, we've, you know, we've planned it a little bit like this, Jerry. We knew it'd be hard running with the Fords with their uh, aero package, but we felt uh, the car's been working good. Now it's getting quicker. I mean, we just run 221 and uh, we're back on the lead lap, so you never know. At 221 and back on the lead lap, what have you had to do in terms of adjustments to get you up to that speed to get into this position? Well, Al's real good at working with the car during the race. He just absolutely never gives up. And we got Alan Mertens here, and we've been working to get the push out, and, and uh, they've done a good job. We, we had a good pit stop, and so, you, you know, stranger things have happened. How concerned are you about the Fords that remain and set the pace? I'm always concerned if people are in front of me. I want to beat the people in front of me. It doesn't matter if they're Fords or Chevys or Buicks or whatever, so... Uh, we're just going to run our race and do the best we can, and hopefully at the at the end we're, we'll be there. All right, that's Rick Gallus calling the shots for Al Unser and keeping an eye as well on Danny Sullivan. Paul? And Jimmy Vassar being taken to an ambulance now after his accident. The Hannah Emergency Medical Center much too busy today. As we take a look now at cars out of the Indianapolis 500, and there are right now 2019 cars still in the action. Guerrero didn't start it. Eric Bachelor, Tom Sneva. Scott Pruitt, Gordon Johncock, neither one of those is a result of injury. Philip Gosh, you saw him. Think back on. to how many of these were crashes. Yep. Stan Fox was involved in the accident with Gosh. Rick Mears, Jim Crawford, Emerson Fittipaldi, all in the same accident. Mario Andretti in a solo accident. Scott Brayton had his engine let go. Paul Tracy pulled to the inside just at the same time that Jimmy Vassar was catching the wall to bring out the current yellow. It looked like on Tracy that it was an engine on his, though. That Valvoline race summary, I'll tell you, it, it's very revealing to see how many of those were accidents. And it is also revealing, uh, there's Lynn St. James's car momentarily in the pits. To see the really great drivers in this sport are coming to the fore right now at the front. Driving conditions are very, very difficult out here right now. And we've got on the leaderboard, Michael Andretti, Eddie Cheever, Ari Leyendijk, Al Unser Jr., Bobby Rahal. These are very, very good drivers. Three four-time winners started this race, Bobby. One of them is out, Rick Mears. A.J. Foyt is 14th, three laps down. And your brother, Bobby, Big Al, is seventh, one lap down. We're still under yellow at the Indianapolis 500. Many of the drivers, like Scott Goodyear, they're very wisely weaving back and forth, trying to keep heat in their tires on this cool day in Indianapolis keeping the temperatures up so the tires will adhere as we're ready to come back to a green flag. They just need to keep that rubber working like a rubber band. The temperature won't come in right now, but they need to work it, Paul. Michael Andretti car won the leader of the race. Here we go. Second place. Any cheaper second. As the green comes out, the 
Mobile comes back up to speed. Boy, they are accelerating very early. They picked up the power in the short shoot between three and four long before they were inside of the and green. Another, another car into the wall. Like you say, Bobby, it's surprising that they have not learned the lesson. Well, I, I really think they have, but I don't think a lot of the drivers remember the old days when tire temperatures were so important before it, Goodyear figured out how to work the rubber. And the guys are just having a problem with it. And it just doesn't look like it's going to get any better. You see guys like Ray Hall and Big Al and Little Al, guys like this that seem to have enough experience, but how does that answer Mario Andretti? He's really good here. It's Brian Bonner who climbs out of the car. Another rookie in this race. And he appears to be okay. That's the good news on Brian. But uh, once again, the tires do not appear to come to temperature. Not a problem with the tire, a problem with a cool day. Brian Bonner was running 16. Yeah. Well, he hit that thing really, really straight head on. Just goes to show you, though, sometimes the impact is just right. The driver doesn't get hurt at all. With Bonner, he's standing on his feet. It doesn't look like he's feet are I don't think he was really up to speed, up though, to do you? Speed, yeah. Exactly. You see, still a hard hit. You know, oh, oh, yeah. How many times could you even hit dead ahead on like he did at 60 miles an hour and survive? I'd, I'd rather be sitting here in the booth than in his car, I'll tell you that. But he's probably doing 100, maybe 100, 120 miles an hour when he hit the wall there. Oh, all of that. Not nearly the 200 that we see, but he was certainly going fast when he got the wall. But Brian Bonner did pop out of that car. Look at the rear wing out okay. bent over there. That just shows you it didn't touch anything. Shows you how hard it hit, Paul. It just bends it over the side. We've had 51 laps under green, 51 under yellow, as we're two laps beyond the halfway point. 255 miles have now been complete. Brian Bonner's dad was a flyer in the Navy in World War II. He's a patriotic guy, Brian, and that explains the uh, flag on his helmet. He put it on just at the time of the Gulf War a little over a year ago. Well, when you see him with a slow motion, you see that he did get the right front hitting the wall just a little bit before it was dead center there, and that probably helped him. Well, not probably, but it did help tremendously. Look at the water coming out. That's on the track. It needs to be cleaned up also. So Michael Andretti, once again under yellow, continues his lead at the Indianapolis 500. ABC Sports Presentation of the Indianapolis 500. Brought to you by Goodyear, number one in time by Miller Genuine Draft, America's fastest going beer. By the Die Hard Battery, now with more power when you need it most. And by Chevrolet, the cars and trucks more people depend on. Brian Bonner out of the car. He sat up and leaned against the roll bar, but he needed a little help getting on to the stretcher, so they'll take him over to the Hanna Emergency Medical Center, named for the previous medical director here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Tom Hanna. And it's located uh, just behind the garage area, not far from the first two turns of the track. It's a fully equipped medical facility. They're quite proud of it here. Jerry Punch reports. Of the 560 acres that comprise the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, one stands alone in terms of importance. On that one quiet acre is the newly expanded Hanna Emergency Medical Center. Inside the sprawling facility are some of the most highly trained medical personnel in the country, poised to save a life under the watchful eyes of Dr. Henry Bach. A flashing red light above the door kicks the system into gear, and Dr. Bach's troops man the communications cubicle. Finally, a telephone rings from the observatory stand, and the medical staff is given the particulars of the accident. Next stop is this computer, which puts the injured driver's complete medical history at their fingertips. This data allows treatment planning even before the injured driver arrives. In my opinion, uh, I can't think of anything to make it more efficient. Uh, aside from the fact that you would put the track uh, around a major hospital that has operating room facilities. Uh, through our planning and through the way the system works out here, a lot of which was developed before I came here, I think that we have the most efficient system that we can under the circumstances that we have people out there driving 200 miles an hour surrounded by a concrete wall. Within moments, a patient presents via one of seven ambulances. Now, a regimented trauma protocol begins. 
the driver's clothing is removed, and a rapid systems assessment is completed with strict attention to parameters of airway, breathing, and circulation. The goal here is very simple. You must buy the driver valuable time by stabilizing any life or limb-threatening injury. Many drivers may need further definitive treatment such as x-rays or even surgery. Thus, the Lifeline helicopter, an airborne emergency room, is always standing by on race day to transport to Methodist Hospital of Indiana, an 1120-bed level one trauma center. The driver that arrives here will already have benefited from this flawless operation that within a sport of danger functions brilliantly. I guess I don't know any way to more fine tune our system than we have. Uh, in terms of experience for our people, in terms of the experience that the hospitals had at Methodist for treating uh, trauma victims, in terms of our assessment on the track and our transportation in a very timely fashion down to the hospital, uh, I feel very confident that we're doing the best job that, uh, that we can do. Henry Baca, very professional and caring emergency care physician. As you look at the Hanna Emergency Center, a lot of people, friends, relatives, crew members waiting. Been so much business in there today. They also take care of spectators in there. Everybody's as well. very fortunate to have Henry Bach. He's uh, besides being in charge, he's a good doctor. Average speed of the race at the halfway point, 127.1 miles an hour. Troy Rutman won in 1952 at 128.7. And here is the Valvoline race summary. After 100 laps, we're actually at the 105th lap. Boy, look at those cautions. Eight caution periods, only 19 cars left running. Watch that loud. You see his head bent over the left. That's a helmet strap pulling it over there. That's how far they have to pull it over because of the centrifugal force, the amount of pressure that your head gets so it's straight when he goes through the turns. Now, here's something to consider. Michael Andretti leads. Eddie Cheever is second. A.J. Boyd comes in for a pit stop. Neither one of those have won. Ari Leyendijk, the third place car, has won the race. Then comes Al Unser Jr., who has not won the race. So will we see a new champion at Indianapolis before this day is over? It certainly seems possible. A.J. Boyd rolls back into the caution period. We'll be back. Back at Indianapolis, we are still under caution as we're looking at Ari Leyendijk's crew members. Notice the guy in the white hood over his head. He was helping get Ari Leyendijk's car out of the pits after a routine stop under the caution. Now watch him. He's there with the refueling equipment with the white helmet on. And as Ari Leyendijk was ready to pull away, he lost his balance and fell on the race car. The worst thing that you could do. He was standing oh. back too far and couldn't hold his balance. He's lucky he didn't get run over, Paul. Thank goodness the rules require the refueler to wear a helmet because he hit the wheel and then bounced off the, the track itself. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, let's update you on first Bobby Rahal. Rahal, as you know, is elected to stay out on those hot tires. He reports that he has a slight push, but he says he would prefer to have the push at this point in time with the track conditions. Ari Leyendijk, on the other hand, they've told him don't try to close in on the leader all overnight. You've got plenty of time, and they feel that they're going to have many more cautions. Well, let me show you something new that's here on pit road as well. These are pagers where you not only can get the subjects that you need, you know, you can be told when you need to call home, but, but check this out. We can now give you the running time and the scores of each of the cars as being by satellite all the way up in the air and then back down here to pit road. Well, check out car number one, Michael Andretti, who is ready to lead the field back to the green. But because of changes under the lap, they will be back in the field. The way they line up at the moment, Al Unser Jr. has the lead, followed by Bobby Rahal, then Michael, then Eddie Cheever, Ari Leyendijk, Scott Goodyear, and Al Unser. They are all on the lead lap, all seven of those cars. Where there were only two on the lead lap, there are now seven. Here's Michael Andretti in the lineup as he comes to the high side looking for room to race. Whoa! And it looks like they got this one safely restarted. Keep in mind, some of the guys that are just ahead of Michael, theoretically, on the same lap, only have to be passed by Michael one time. They'll go down the last they were down. This there goes Michael time. alongside Danny Sullivan. Chasing the leader of 
the race. There he is in front of him, Al Hunter Jr. Michael comes to the inside, and Michael has the lead once again as he flashes across that yard of bricks that is the start-finish line in Indianapolis. And just that quickly, at the 110th lap, Michael Andretti is back to the front. An incredible drive. You can just see, he not only is handling good, but he's got the power. He really puts it down. He passes those Chevrolets like they were standing still, Paul. It means that Chevrolet is going to go back to work. Sandy Andretti watching so carefully. Look at John Andretti. As he starts to pick up position as well. Now remember the field is mixed in at this point with a number of cars that are running off of the lead pace. Michael Andretti cut that first lap coming back to green at 208 miles an hour. His cousin, John Andretti here. Had problems in the pits earlier. John Andretti, good little driver. Running in 17th position now. Many laps adrift. It's very hard for a driver in a big race like this to basically have little or no chance to win, but be out there exposed to all the same danger than you would if you were contending the lead. Cheever and Lion Dyke. That's Cheever on the outside. Lion Dyke to the inside as they battle with one another. Well, that got kind of crowded there for a minute. They had that Mexican standoff going into the turn, Paul, and then guy is between them. And the fight there is for fourth place as the teammates. Again, Ford power on both of those cars fight, and for the moment it's resolved in favor of Lion Dyke. And you see these terrific low-level cameras called lipstick cameras that are showing you just how much small debris there is on that track. Danny Cheever and Lion Dyke both in the Chip Ganassi car. And it's been wondering, all not people have been wondering, which one of them is the fastest driver? Both Ford powers, both Lola cars, all new stuff. Thus far, we have had nine cautions in the race. Most cautions, 1988, 14 of them. Gary Bettenhausen in the yellow car having himself a fine day. Bettenhausen running in sixth place right now and keeping the Buick hopes alive. Pitting. Ray Hall on Pitting. the pit road. Well, that isn't a good sign. Nope. Ray Hall's bidding a lot, a lot earlier than he should be. Well, they just made a stop under that yellow a few laps ago, so we'll watch Ray Hall to see what the problem could possibly be. This is, ironically, almost the same point that he went out of the race last year, just as he seemed to have a chance to win it. Jack Arun is right there, Jack. It's a flat tire, fellas. They had to come in and change a tire. Now, remember, he's the one that gambled to stay out on old tires. It came up the wrong way for him this time. Only 9.7 seconds to change the tire. All right, a flat tire is going to be from Debris, not being worn out. And the problem is, is that would have made any difference if it was a new tire or used one. But with all the wrecks we have, just imagine how many little pieces may be laying around that racetrack. Ray Hall went into the pits in fifth place, but he dropped back during that. Scott Goodyear, for one, was able to get around. Very costly stop for Ray Hall. Under the green, that's yeah. bad time. Jeff Andretti. Jeff Andretti catches the wall. This time, several laps back into the green flag. Driving A.J. Foyt's car. Oh. Gary Bettenhausen and Gary just well. talked about his run, a fine run. Look Cut at the short. tire on the left, still rotating, still rolling down the track. The debris is still early. Gary Bettenhausen, there's his car. He's failed to finish 15 of his 20 Indy 500s. The tire finally rolls to a stop from 200 miles an hour. And exactly 20 years ago, Gary Bettenhausen almost had this race won. Small problem right near the end really robbed this man of being a winner of the Indy 500. Gary's car doesn't look too bad. The left front has been a little bit, and he shouldn't have many problems. He has problem getting out because his left arm doesn't work too good he from a prior good. accident right yeah yeah he can he can still drive good with it though it doesn't bother him a bit doesn't look too bad in terms of uh, a little easier to repair and not much damage to gary but that car is out of the race another look at it bobby unser now just violently boy. violently boy jeff looked like a wheel was off the car before the car started spinning and jeff really caught the wall hard Gary Bentonhausen was behind the accident. Now he's talking with the crews on how they're going to hook his car. Boy, those were both Lolas. 27 Lolas started the race and the... Now watch, watch, watch. See, that wheel's already yes, gone. Yeah, the right rear came off of that thing. It happened so fast. I didn't catch it a while ago, but watch as it goes around there. There is no right rear. There's the right rear rolling down the track. 
Now, that's about the worst tire you could lose because the rear end is going to come around when that happens. But, Bobby, aren't there supposed to be locks now to prevent that? Well, Paul, there are, and I really can't explain that. That's a head-on crash. Uh, that's, that's, that's a bad hit right there for Jeff. Same angle PK hit at. Uh, and just the a tub bad heavily bad. damaged. But you're right. The wheel, even if the, the nut that holds the wheel on were left loose, Paul, there's a safety lock on there yeah. that should prevent it from coming off, and I can't answer that one for you. And once again, the safety crews who have worked far, far too much today are huddled around another car, and this time it belongs to Jeff Andretti. It's an A.J. Mario Foyt Andretti's, entry. Mario yeah, Andretti's like. youngest son. Yep. Twelve cars have been sidelined by accidents. And we're just past the halfway point in the Indy 500. So a race riddled with accidents and a very strange start. We'll be back. Out on the track as the field works under caution past the safety crews work still trying to cut Jeff Andretti out of A.J. Foyt's car. Jeff started this race as a teammate to A.J. Foyt. By the way, this accident moves A.J. into the top ten. Bobby Unzer, look at it again. Maybe we can figure out why Gary Bentonhausen got involved. Yes, well, you see, that's Jeff Andretti. Boom, right head on into the wall. Really bad. I think probably the hub broke on the right rear. I doubt that the safety deal, the safety lock, lock came loose. But now you watch that tire bouncing, and it bounces to the left. We'll see another shot of it here in just a moment. Report, by the way, the update. I'll give it to you while we watch. Now there's this. Jeff hitting the wall head on. There's the tire going around. It bounces. It comes back. Now watch that tire when it comes back down and it shoots to the inside of the track. Gary Bettenhausen runs into it, hits his left front on it, and that's what put Gary out right there. There you can see the debris from Gary's car after the tire hits it and he catches the inside wall. The report from the safety officials here is that Jeff Andretti is conscious and they're just taking their time being very careful at this moment cutting him out of that car. but you know we've got two Andretti's right now on their way to the hospital not good news giant crowd here has seen a most unusual race earlier this month the fastest rookie to that point had trouble like we're seeing here now his name of course Nelson Piquet Sam Posey has an update on his situation during his 13 years in Formula One, Nelson Piquet won a total of 22 races and three world championships, an historic career. At the end of last year, without a ride for 92, he went home to Brazil. Then came the Indy offer, which Nelson saw as giving him a chance to race while still leaving time to enjoy life. We spoke to him two weeks ago, just before his crash. I'm nearly 40 now, and after everything I've done, um, I would like to have a little bit better quality of life. <laughs> When I say quality of life, is maybe sleeping in one in one bed for many days. You know, it's in we all in the road in Formula One. We've been all in hotels and different places and different hotels, different pillows, and and uh, that's go forever. And you know, I've been done to for 13 years. It's uh, you know you 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 miss everything. You miss um, you know a house, a dog, everything. The former world champion made driving at Indy look easy, running at over 228 miles an hour until this. Turn four, a 360 degree spin head on into the wall, virtually injury free in his years in Formula One, Nelson's luck had run out. The injuries to his feet and legs are brutal. What an irony that a man just starting to think about a life beyond racing suddenly faces that life with injuries that will make it very different than he could have imagined. And Nelson Piquet remains hospitalized about three miles from where we're standing right now here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He has undergone a fourth operation, four procedures in as many days in 17 days, a total of 14 hours in the operating room. Now, I'm told by Dr. Terry Trammell, he will probably be discharged in about seven to ten days. The primary rehab, about six months. Will he walk? They think he will in about six or eight months. Getting in a race car, probably more than one year. Let's go down to Pit Road and Jack Aroot. Well, you can see Jeff Andretti being removed now from his race car, loaded into the ambulance. You know, the tough thing here, of course, is on Michael Andretti, because now two, you know, his dad and, and uh, his brother, uh, he's seen both see wrecks. moving around there, though. That's a good sign. That's encouraging. Now, back at Milwaukee in 1987, uh, 
John Andretti was, uh, Michael Andretti was leading that race when his uh, uh, dad, Mario, crashed. It uh, almost threw him off mentally, but he did go on to win that, a curious omen. But you know, as he comes by and you see Michael Andretti there on the left, what he's thinking, and it isn't good. So, Jack Aroot, you have more? Paul, absolutely I do. In fact, before he realized it was Jeff it was Jeff Andretti that had crashed, he was complaining because he thought he'd run over some debris and thought he might need to bring the car on pit road. Then when he discovered it was Jeffrey and when Jeffrey was still pinning the car, he's been extremely animated on the radio. The crew behind me have been trying to reassure him that every bit of information that they get on the condition of Jeff, they are passing on to Michael Andretti. While Andretti is leading this race, he has had his share of problems and concerns about his blood family. Here at the track uh, for this 500-mile race, Max Mosley, the head of the FISA, the International Race Sanctioning Body, is viewing his very first Indianapolis 500. Bertie Martin, the head of Actors, the Automobile Competition Committee of the United States, is here as well. We take a look after 119 laps. 17 cars are out of this race. We've had 10 caution periods thus far as we look through the rundown of the field. Paul, I can certainly relate to the Andretti thing between the two brothers, between Michael and Jeff there, because Al and I raced together for a long time. There they are all the way through. Look at that long list of cars out. Now, in the mid-60s, a lot of Formula One drivers came over here. Jackie Stewart, Jimmy Clark, most notable among them. Graham Hill took a victory here. But how do the Formula One drivers of today view the Indianapolis 500? We had an opportunity a week ago to ask them. Are they interested? What do they think of the Indianapolis 500? All I can say is uh, I believe there's some fantastic drivers out there in America, and uh, you know, I take my hat off to certainly a few of them for what they uh, have already accomplished and what they do. Well, I think that uh, it's, a, it's a challenge, but uh, it's quite different from what we do. And I think uh, uh, every discipline uh, must have their own experience. So if I have to go to Indianapolis, probably have to start everything uh, again. And I don't know if that is the case after so many years of Formula One. If you're successful in Formula One, you can also do well in India and vice versa. There is no secret, no miracle. If you know how to drive a racing car, you change the characteristics of it, conditions, but uh, if you know how to do it, you'll be doing one way or the other well in any place in the world. Freddie would like nothing better than to be able to go to Formula One and become part of that world, but probably it's contingent on his winning Indianapolis, or at least if he were able to win here today, it would help him considerably getting into Formula One. Sandy Andretti, the Andretti family having a tough day. Coming up later today on ABC Sports, four of the world's top women golfers will tee it up. The pressure is mounting, $115,000 on the first hole. It's a winner-take-all with thousands of dollars riding on each hole. Coverage of the J.C. Penney LPGA Skins game continues after the Indianapolis 500 today on ABC Sports. Let's go down to Gary Gerald now. Paul, on this most unusual day of racing, there's been incidents in the pits as well. You saw Big Jim Wilson, the vent man for Ari Leyendijk, take that tumble, get hit by the wheel. This is why fuelers and vent men wear helmets. You see the wheel mark on the helmet. But in the spirit of camaraderie, a new vent man has been brought into the team. Lance Loffman, who comes over from Jim Crawford's team, the Quaker State team, has now donned the gear. He's back in the race, now a part of the team for Ari Leyendijk to service him on future stops. A lot of camaraderie on this strange day here in the pits. Well, when they say racing is a family, Lynn St. James, this race has been so hard on the rookies. Only she and Ted Prappas, the only two rec rookies of the seven that started, left in this race. She's going to emerge as one of the heroes of this race. She's used her head. She's used her experience as a racing driver, of which she has she has quite a lot. She's doing a very good job out here. Yes, she is, Tim. She's a darn good driver. Look at the guys now. They realize that There's they have Ted a Prappas. problem. He's the other rookie, the 31 car. And a guy that barely made it into the race. He had two accidents here last year during qualifying. Went back to Los Angeles pretty well beaten up. And he came back determined to make it into the field. I think he was scared and spooked by this place throughout most of the month. He must be pretty pleased right now with the way things he are He currently going. runs 11. You can watch those guys trying to work their tires. Now I started to say a bit ago that they really know it's a problem. They're taking it seriously. Now they're getting ready to go for the green. There it is. As we come back to the green flag again, 
Now it's a matter of being very, very careful. Michael Andretti is the leader of the race. In second place is the number six car of Ari Leyendijk. His teammate, Eddie Cheever, runs in third place. In fourth place is Al Hunter Jr. And his dad is just behind little Al. The move is inside Ray Hall, but Ray Hall runs in seventh, so he is a lap down, not a battle for position. Ray Hall's big problem was he stopping under the green with a flat tire, just in case people forgot. Ray Dropped Hall, him to seventh out of the uh, battle for the lead. Ray Hall tried to hold on to that car, was hoping that he wouldn't have to bring it in. But Here it comes became, Little Al. This is going to be an Al exciting closing move. closing on the back of Bobby Ray Hall. But and now, he comes around to the inside does he have quickly. the downforce to stay ahead of him through the turn? The answer is yes. No problem. I talked to little Al before the race started. He told me, he said, Uncle Bobby, I'm going to keep a lot of downforce in the car. Because even though it's cold today, they thought they'd get a lot more adhe adhesion. The tires are just not working good on the real cold racetrack. Well, this is an example, as you see Michael Andretti, of a day with a really good driver are coming to the fore. The guys who can adjust to the situation, and it is changing lap to lap. First and second place flash across the line. You know, I don't think there was any driver here today that foresaw the problems with the cold track and the tires at the same time. I just don't think it was, I don't think it came to the mind of anybody because it usually, it's a dream to have it that way. You know, with the changes that they make from the, uh, to the cars from pit stop to pit stop, you can get a very different complexion to the race. And I think suddenly here, Ari Leyendijk pursuing Michael Andretti, I think it's the first time during the day that we've seen another car on the track substantially as fast is Michael Andretti. This is very exciting racing. That's Mika Leyendijk, Ari's wife. We're at lap 124, and I think we've got a race on our hands. They penalized Eddie Cheever by one lap as he passed under the yellow flag, and so that sticks him down in the field, down to sixth position. Here's the Valvoline last lap summary speed for Ari Leyendijk at 221.6 miles an hour. About the same time, Michael Andretti has been running 224. Michael is really fine. Remember now, during the practice sessions and after qualifications, the guys all decided what do they want to do? Do they want to set their cars up for the latter part of the race, which would mean not too much wing, so they would have a lot of straightaway speed, or would they like to have a lot of downforce? Now, I think what we're seeing now is like with Eddie Chair, or excuse me, with Lion Dyke right there, is they probably left a lot of downforce in their car, knowing that it might get slippery, and they have a lot of horsepower to pull it. Makes a lot of difference in how the different drivers set up. Might make a lot of difference on the different wrecks we've had today, Paul. Well, so Michael Andretti in front, Ari Leyendijk in second. Al Unser Jr. is third. His dad is fourth. Fifth is Scott Goodyear. Eddie Cheever Ari has been pushed down in the field as a result of that penalty. Ari moving his head around a little unusually in the cockpit there. I'm not sure what that could be about. Uh, maybe a little strain to the neck muscles. I would not want to have Ari Leyendijk stalking me because it was a race very like this that he wound up winning two years ago, Bobby. Sam, the new Lola's have had, uh, had a lot of buffeting inside the cockpit, and that's probably what's moving his head around. He'd probably like to move his neck a little bit besides just a whipping back and forth that the air, air does to the driver. You think with all the yellows, they've been able to rest their necks, but the G-forces are so high here that you get very tired racing this race. In between the helmet straps or the, the uh, pads on the right-hand side, they can't move them like the old days. There's fourth place. That's your brother, four-time winner of the Indy 500. We talked about Rick Mears coming in here. Is it possible your brother's going to be the first five-time winner? Well, Paul, it certainly could happen. They have the horsepower and the Buick to do it. He hasn't had a lot of practice with it, though. Let's go to the pits, Gary Carroll. Here's Chip Ganassi. What's happened about this penalty for Eddie Cheever? Gary, I have no idea. I mean, they came in and just walked over and said that we passed Al Jr. under the yellow. I don't know when. I don't know how. And, I mean, uh, that's not something that Eddie does. I don't understand why we do that. We've been ahead of the guy all day. Why we'd have to pass him under the yellow to get up on him, I, we wouldn't have, we don't have to do that. So, I mean, I, I want to know what lap. I know nothing about it right now. I'm waiting to talk to you, Zach. Is there an appeal process? Well, there better be. If there is, I'm going to be on it. All right. You heard it from Chip Ganassi. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Well, Gary Gerald, we finally caught up with Gary Bettenhausen. Gary had such a terrific run going. Take us through the accident. Well, I think it was a black car. I think it was maybe Jeff Andretti. I'm not sure. Spun coming off a of turn two, and, and parts and pieces flew everywhere, and and I was trying to dodge a debris, and I guess a, a tire came out of the sky and hit my car in the left front wheel and knocked the tow in out, put me out of the race. 
the Bettenhausen family continues to be star-crossed here. How many more years can you come back? Because, boy, you've had some terrific rides. I don't know. We, right from the start, well, we, had, we ran good for a few laps and then problems, and then uh, we got the car working and running good. Then I killed the engine on one stop, and uh, but I don't know. Paul, take my word. He'll be back next year. You bet he will, and he'll always be fast. Gary Bettenhausen lives 40 miles from the track here. Al Unser runs in fourth place. Now, here's the official word that they say that Eddie Cheever passed the number 11 car of Raul Boisel. Remember, Raul is replacing Hiro Mashusta, who broke his leg in an accident here earlier in the month. And at the same time, though, the contest seems to be that Cheever is maintaining that Raul waved him past. Michael just kicked the lap speed up. Now, get this, 228.6 miles an hour. So Michael is upping the ante as we take a look at the Valvoline race summary. 10 cautions, the record is 14. 16 cars are running, fewest cars running at the finish of this race. 1966, remember they had that first lap accident? Only seven finished that race. You know, all that just shows you, if he's got that kind of speed that he's had it all along, he's led this entire race for the most practical part of it, and it just shows you what the price of poker could be at the latter part of the race. Now, all the other team guys monitor every lap, so they'll be knowing what it's going to take to outrun Michael towards the latter part. To see Big Al competitive with that Buick makes me remember that, you know, he passed his driver's test back in 65 with a Maserati engine uh, la uh, car. And since then, he's driven Fords, Alfies, and he gave both Cosworth and Chevy their first Indy victory. So think of that as he now leads the Buick contingent. What would happen if those Fords started to drop by the wayside that are ahead of him? You just saw the valve plane last lap speed for Big Al. Certainly this track, 221 miles an hour right now. Boy, I remember the last time that he came to this race to replace somebody. Danny and Gaius was supposed to drive for Roger yep. Petsky, then Danny couldn't. They put Al in an old car, and he went on to take his fourth win. And this time he's replaced this month. The, the, the injured Nelson P.K., who we just had an update on. The point is, he had a brilliant qualifying run after almost no practice in the car at all. And I guess, Bobby, your brother, there's Paul Newman, is just a real good racing driver, even now in his almost mid-50s. Well, more than any other racetrack in the world, Indianapolis respects people that know what they're doing, experience. And Al has a lot of experience. Being a four-time winner, he already knows how to win. And that helps an awful lot here. Poor rookies, they have to stay here a long time before they can get these advantages. A.J. Foyt waves Michael past, almost a salute as he came past. A.J. running down low on the track. Michael still not in contest at all. A.J. Foyt running low because he was heading down into the pit area. Well, it looked as if Ari Lyondike, and you see A.J. coming into the pits here, was going to give Michael Andretti a run for his money. But when Michael responded with those incredibly fast laps, the fastest we've ever seen in a race here, he is now pulled away almost to a nine-second lead. Yes, and I just put a stopwatch on him, Sam. He goes from 228 down to 213. So it shows that he's really being the smart driver that he is, and he wants to win the race, not just show everybody that he can lead it. The running order after 130 laps. Of course, Mike Andretti continues to be the dominant factor. Tremendous number of cars out, and many of those as a result of accidents here. But Michael Andretti is looking very solid. Just turned the last lap at 225. The winner of the $10,000 Gillette Halfway Challenge Driver Award, as per the contest rules, is Michael Andretti. Stay tuned to hear the lucky winner of a brand new Chevrolet Corvette. the wall running in second place. Boy, look at that left front tire still spinning. What happened is he lost his brakes as soon as Mika he did the right there front tire the She's worried. She knows what's happened because they've been in radio touch. They instantly know what's going on in the pits. This is the first race that Ari hasn't finished here in three years. 
He owns a gallery out in Phoenix. This is obviously a major disappointment for the Ganassi team, which will now have to rely on Eddie Cheever. You know what I liked about Ari Leyendijk when he won the Indianapolis 500? The first winner in a long time that brought his whole family up to share the joy of the celebration of winning the five. Introduced his son, little Ari, and his wife. It was really a grand He's moment. a wonderfully warm man. He was given a standing ovation here the other day by the fans as he walked along pit wall. I'm sure they'll be very disappointed to see him. Long before the apex of the corner, Bobby. Uh, he certainly did, and it's just a question now, what made the thing jump out like that? There's looks something. like a half shaft. I was just going to say, that thing going off to the side there looks like an axle, Paul. So would you expect to see a CV joint? All right, now you just think about it now. If they have a vibration, the CV joint breaks, the axle would come out. Only one tire would drive. That could easily be the problem. Far upper right corner. Yes, Paul, in fact, you see, the car just literally went straight. Most likely, he didn't lose his steering. That piece we saw come out has to be a half shaft. Fortunately, good angle of impact with the wall. Ari should be okay, but Mika is still concerned, and we're back under yellow. Still cleaning up the debris from Ari Leyendijk's accident. That means now, with this accident, the front runners are Ford, Chevrolet and Buick running one, two, three. Michael Andretti, Al Unser Jr., and Big Al. One more angle of it, Bobby. He was pretty lucky the way he yes. caught that wall. And on this particular one, we, we didn't see that drive or axle going off the side. All right, further information, Gary Gerald. Yeah, this is uh, what Eddie Cheever dragged in on his car. It's a piece of jab rock from the skid plate underneath the car, not from his car, but apparently from his teammate Lion Dykes. It did not damage Cheever's car, but this is the kind of thing that drivers are always concerned about, debris of any kind on the racetrack. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Well, Gary, there may be a small problem on Michael Andretti's car. By our calculations, he should be able to go with one more stop. But on the fueling of the last time that they came in under caution, they did not take on a full load of fuel. By our calculations, they may be minus about two gallons. Well, that could have an adverse effect on his run for a win in the Indianapolis 500. Michael Andretti, still under caution, is still the leader. Back at the Indianapolis 500, still under caution. Next Saturday on ABC Sports, the Professional Bowlers Tour returns in the first of eight consecutive high-rolling tournaments. The big strikers head to the Pacific Northwest for the Seattle Open. And then, on ABC's Wide World of Sports, America's top young gymnasts meet Japan in the Dodge Challenge. Then it's an elite field in the Advil Mini Marathon from New York City. That's all next Saturday on ABC Sports. This, by the way, is the, uh, coming up in two days, the 50th anniversary of the American Forces Radio and Television Service, who has carried this race both on radio and television for such a long time to all of the servicemen and women around the world. During 120 that, countries, over 300 outlets. During that round of uh, pit stops, Ted Prappas was in long enough to give the lead in the Rookie of the Year competition to Lynn St. James. She's now the highest placed rookie running 13th. By the way, most of those AFRTS broadcasters are, are trained right here at the Defense Information School in Indianapolis. So here's what we have. Al Unser Jr. is in the lead, followed by his dad. And Scott Goodyear, who was back in 33rd at one point, rides in third place. So Al Unser Jr. out in front. What kind of a man is he when he is in the cockpit? Cold, calculating, or is he emotional? We asked him just that question. I try to stay low-keyed. Uh, my car owner will tell you I get very emotional. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I, I try to, uh, you know, maintain uh, a logical thinking pattern through the whole deal. Well, there he is. Bobby, what do you think? The Unser family's looking pretty strong at this point. Well, I just hope they know those tires are not getting hold of the ground real good, Paul. <laughs> 141 laps are complete, still under the caution, and we've had a lot of them today, 11 different caution periods. Approaching the record, which is 14, 1988, 18 cars out of the running as a result of either accidents 
or other mishaps here at the speedway. You can lift a little out as he as we watch the in car up in there and he accelerates. He's trying to keep his tires warm. He takes off and backs off, takes off. All right, taking a look down the order now. Let's give it to you. Alan Sir Jr. is in front, then Little Al, Scott Goodyear, Michael Andretti, Bobby Rahal, Eddie Cheever, Danny Sullivan, Raul Boisel, John Paul Jr., A.J. Foyt, Dominic Dobson, Lynn St. James, Ted Prappas, John Andretti, and Buddy Lazier. Here's the Valvoline race summary with the cars out of the race, and it's one very long list. Roberto Guerrero didn't even make it to the green flag. Remember that accident with Philippe Gosh and Stan Fox? Very scary. Both of them are okay. Rick Mears, Crawford, Fittipaldi, Mario Andretti, Scott Brayton with a blown engine, Jimmy Vassar in that accident, Jeff Andretti, Gary Bentonhausen in that accident, and then most recently Ari Leyendijk when he caught the wall. The Valvoline race summary for you on a very busy day at Indianapolis. This is certainly going to be a day, no matter how it comes out, that Michael Andretti is going to remember his father and his brother both in the hospital, and he is dominating this race. There's your first place car, Al Unser Jr. Look back in the field, and there is Big Al. He runs in second place. And there is Scott Goodyear, the fifth year car. Boy, what a great run. Scott Goodyear, him. the Canadian, the young Canadian, is having basically the best show on an oval of now, his life right now. Look at this. There is Michaels. They're coming back to the green. John Andretti kind of signaled to Michael while they were on the, uh, the uh, caution laps. And he indicated, why don't you take this side of me when we come back? And that is Cheever running down low right behind Scott Goodyear as we're back to full speed racing. Cheever needs to get unlapped. He's making a hard run at the start there. That's how he can get back on the same lap because of the penalty that Eustack gave him. So he's really trying hard on that. First four cars run on the lead lap. Eddie Cheever driving as fast as he can now, trying to catch up to the leaders. And also keep, keep your mind that Little Al is out in front, but he knows that Michael Andretti is right behind, not too far, and he does have speed on everybody, Michael does. So Eddie Cheever has some distance to make up. Went down a lap because of the penalty. They said that he passed Raul Boisel under the yellow. Chip Ganassi, the car's owner, certainly disputes that. Bobby Rahal has made it back onto the lead lap as well. There's all of them. Look at John Andretti come down to that inside line of the yellow car. Usually, if you go down a lap in a race like this one, you're out of business. That has not been true today. Boy, with all these accidents, that's changed that totally. Usually, it's like Sam says, the lap in Indianapolis is the end of you. Of course, Rick Mears doesn't believe that. He's been a lap down and then won the thing. Now Michael having to work his way carefully through the field. That's supposed to sell in front of him. And Michael gets around. And Michael, by the way, continuing to climb up the all-time leader list. He started the day in 27th place. Considering that long lineage here at the Speedway, Michael now runs in 14th. Most recently passing the records of Maury Rose, Roger Ward, Rex Mays, Johnny Rutherford, Bill Holland, and Jimmy Clark. Wow. Michael Andretti leads a lot of races. He leads the typical IndyCar races that are held throughout the rest of the season, often winning uh, with a majority of laps led. There he rips past A.J. Foyt. Now, A.J., just by staying in there, is giving himself a great day in his 35th Indianapolis. A.J. runs in 10th place now as Michael coming back up through the field. And ready to do battle with the leader of the race, Al Unser Jr., after getting past Big Al. Little Al, 220 mile an hour lap. Now, that's kind of showing you how hard he's running to try to stay ahead of Michael. He knows Michael's coming. Yeah, but remember, Michael, we've seen him in the race at laps above 225 miles an hour, Bobby. Well, but Gallus has already told little Al, Al that, and he's counting on the traffic. But there he goes by it. And there's right. Big Al making look a move. Big Al taking it back. Big Al gets it back. All right. Al saw that one coming. Boy, there's a bet. Boy, move. that's oh, the first it. time Michael has been passed in anger all day long. And I'll bet anger is a word that figures in Michael's cockpit. Where right did now. that come from? That's good racing. That was a good pass. He, uh, Michael did get a little bit caught there. Uh, don't you agree behind Cheever? And, and that gave uh, Al a 
run at him. But even so, we'll see how quickly he can counterattack. Well, plus drafting helps an awful lot. Plus that Buick engine, we know that that has a lot of power, and he gets it running. Michael, there's no way he's going to do anything but go right on by, which he did. So this is the fight for second place. Sandy Andretti is having one very long day. Big Al almost out of nowhere. Now here comes Michael back to the inside, and Michael takes Big Al. Yeah, the way those things like that happen so easy, where it looked like Michael had so much power, he has two gears in the transmission. One to turn a lot of RPM, which makes him move a lot faster, and the other one for cruise, which gives you a lot better gas mileage and also saves the engine. It was Michael not the time. had the reserve, and we've watched that all day, haven't we? Yeah, it was not the time to cruise, was it? <laughs> it was time to get back past. We're watching a terrific battle for second place at Indy Jackaroos. Paul, actually what happened is Michael Andretti for most of the race have been running in that higher gear. They had told him early on, pop it up there because you don't seem to have much competition. As soon as he was challenged, he popped it down to that other gear. And then as soon as he got by him, he's back up to the top gear again. But Jack, let it be noted that at one point in this race, this amazing, historic, strange race, that Al Unser, the two Unser's father and son, were running one, two here. A very historic moment, but also don't forget, Paul, uh, uh, Sam, we've got a long way to go, and so much happens in that last, last Buddy part. La Buddy Lazier slows down on the backstretch. He's had a good race today. That's sad for Buddy Lazier. He needs to finish it. Young driver from Denver, Colorado. And he's not going to make it back to the pits, and that should bring out yet another caution and slow this field down. As the caution comes out, 149 laps are now complete at the Indianapolis 500. Al Unser Jr. continues to be the leader. We've had over two hours of yellow. We'll be back with more from Indianapolis after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Lazier, he was still in the car when we left you. You want the definition of a hot seat? When those engines let go, sometimes the hot water sprays forward, gets in the cockpit, Bobby. Well, you know, if that's oil instead of water, which I think is water, but if it were, it stays hot a long time. It doesn't cool right away, you know. Looks like Buddy's okay. Another report now. Let's go to the hospital. Jerry Punch has an update on Jeff Andretti. Actually, Jeff Andretti and other drivers, as Dr. Henry Bach is standing by. Henry, what's the news? Uh, Brian Bonner has gone down to Methodist Hospital with a uh, bruised left foot and a right shin injury. He's going down for uh, x-rays and further evaluation. Uh, Jimmy Vassar is going down for what appears to be a fractured right thigh bone or right femur bone. Uh, he also needs uh, other um, evaluation for that. Uh, Jeff Andretti has gone down. He suffered a concussion. He is awake, however. He also uh, suffered some severe injuries to both of his feet and to his ankles. It's going to be difficult to tell the extent of those until we see his x-rays. And um, Ari Leyendijk uh, should be released from here uh, shortly with a bruised right foot. Henry Jeff Andretti's injuries uh, similar to that of Nelson Piquet, both lower extremities? It appears to be both lower extremities, but uh, without x-rays, it's really difficult to tell the extent of the bony injury to his feet. That's a word here from the hospital, gentlemen. Well, some good news, some not so good. Another piece of jab rock. That's the uh, underside of the car from somebody's car still left out there lying on the track. Now what that happens there is they're wearing out the bottom of the cars from rubbing going in on that bump into turn three. It's just a small bump, but that shows you how close they run them to the ground. We ride with Danny Sullivan as we take a look at the Valvoline race summary after 150 laps, 12 cautions, two away from the record 14 cars running very very long race now just an update too on michael andretti let's remember that he didn't get a full tank of fuel they brought him back in they got him a full tank of fuel that's what pulled him out of the lead going into the last green uh, let's go to gary gerald 
Less than 50 laps to go with Rick Gallus. You've worked your way up here now to this top spot. The threat still seems to be Michael Andretti. How do you play it now in these final 48 laps? Uh, we just go out there, Gary, and run as hard as we can. Michael's, uh, he's quick today, but we're running quick here at the end and actually was pulling away a little bit from him. But on the other hand, he's run some 227 laps. So we're just going to keep doing what we're doing and hopefully we'll be okay. Why did you elect to bring him in for fuel on this time? Because that means we can do it one more stop. Okay, there we've got the information from Rick Gallus. Let's go back to Jerry Punch. Ari Leondike has walked out of the infield care center. First of all, Ari, are you okay? Well, I'm very, uh, very well. I mean, I didn't hurt myself at all. So, I, you know, I feel good. I'm happy that I'm not hurt. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of guys have gotten hurt this month and today. So uh, I'm glad I'm not one of them. What happened with the car? Well, it was, uh, it was a typical racing accident. Uh, I went below one of the back markers, and as I was beside him, he didn't see I was there, so he came down on me, and he forced me way down low on the apron. And when I went into turn four, I bottomed out with the front end, and what happens then, it lifts the wheels off the ground, and after that, I had no steering. By the time I had my steering back, you know, by the time the front end had settled again, I was back, uh, I was in the gray, and I was in the... In, in the uh, in the dirty uh, stuff on the track, and there was no way. I tried everything I could to keep it away from the wall, but there was no way. Ari Leindyke, one of the few drivers to walk out of the care center here this afternoon. Paul? On a long, different, very difficult day, Ted Prappas's car being pushed to the side. Lynn St. James is now the last rookie left. She runs in 11th place. Of course, the uh, determination of the rookie of the year here is subjective by a vote of committee. So who will be the rookie? Who, who knows? Michael Andretti out in front. Next Sunday on ABC Sports, the World League playoffs kick off with an invitation to the World Bowl on the line. The European champion Barcelona Dragons will take on the North American West Division winning Sacramento Surge and quarterback David Archer's dangerous passing attack. It's a World League playoff action next Sunday at 3 o'clock Eastern. Now let's go back again to Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, we updated you on that faulty fuel filler nozzle. They've got that corrected here on Michael Andretti's car, and they filled it up with fuel. But now after looking at Mario Andretti's car, after it was brought in on the hook, they see that he had excessive brake wear. So they have cautioned Michael over the radio, when you're running in traffic, be sure to be kind of ginger on the brakes, to use them gingerly, because we're not sure just what we got in the brakes. Boy, what a concern for Michael Andretti. One of the three Goodyear blimp stars and stripes has been in operation less than two weeks, is based in Pompano Beach, Florida. You're looking at the camera view from that blimp, which now floats quite lazily over the south chute here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Well, what a beautiful shot that is. And that brake wear with, with Mario, a lot of that is caused trying to keep the engine warm during the yellows. They ride the brake and keep the turbo lit, because without the turbo charger going, you just don't make heat in the engine and they but have those carbon fiber brakes as well which I think wear down a little faster no they actually don't wear as fast now. them they'll last probably 20 times as long but it's the only way it's like a dynamometer it's the only way that they can make heat in the engine if the if the pistons do not get a lot of heat the engine just doesn't see it see? and what about the possibility of being out of brakes if he runs a fast lap he doesn't really need him but if he's in traffic now if he had any brakes at all he's going to be okay they use so little and he's starting out in front ball he'll not have problems with that all right michael andretti there's danny sullivan danny continuing his run in fifth place michael of course the leader scott goodyear now in second what a great run for scott were this to be, team. were this to become a battle between little al and michael Reflect that these are the great second generation drivers of the day. They both started about the same time. Neither has won this race. And Michael Andretti comes off the fourth third with Scott Goodyear right in pursuit as the green flag flies again on the 154th lap. Get a good view of the rest of the field. There's Big Al. The leaders at the moment not in contact as they have to work through other traffic to get in contact once again. Often these cars are painted the same. At the end of the race, we can tell. Big Al's in the yellow car. There's Michael to the, or excuse me, little Al to the left there. You can tell him because we don't have so many lookalikes in the race. Ten of the 12 Buicks that started this race are out, but one of them in Al Unser's car runs in fourth place. The other belongs to John Paul Jr. He currently runs at night. Aboard Al Unser Jr. in third place. Your speed seeing what it looks like to go about 230 miles an hour. Learning our calculus.
calculations up here in the booth. Little Al didn't need to stop the last time. He could have done one more la or one more stop to the end and stayed in front and raced Michael. When Rick Gallus said they'd done that, you, you didn't look too happy about it. No, I think it was a bad decision. I don't think Rick did right on that one. In fact, I'm pretty sure he didn't. But he often sees things through a different set of eyes, and maybe he had other, other good reasons for it, Paul. You know, as you reported, Scott Goodyear is second. Realize he started this race dead last. Absolutely. Took the car that was qualified by Mike Croft. That was a prior agreement that if uh, Scott Goodyear got pushed out of the race, that he would take over Mike Croft's car. That's exactly what he did. Started 33rd, now runs in second. He did, and Jim O'Donnell, the owner of that day, the guy that sponsors it, has got to be one happy man because he knows he has a good race driver in Scott Goodyear. Tom Deja Sneva. vu. Tom Sneva drove from 33rd to second in 1980. Will Scott Goodyear be the second man to do that, or maybe 33rd to first? Remember, three years ago in 1989, little Al tracking Emerson Fittipaldi, same view. Much the same situation. There's his wife, Shelly, tapping that pencil. Don't think that the driver's wives don't feel emotions in the pits. And Big Al and Little Al right there together. Now, in case anybody said watching TV and wondering about the father and son here, hey, it's not father and son as far as they're concerned. If Big, if Big Al can take Little Al, go on by him, he'll do it. Little Al runs in third place. Big Al now closes in. Years ago, back in 1983, Little Al did some blocking for Big Al, but uh, trying to get Sneva slowed up a little bit. I don't think we're going to see that happen today. No, and that really wasn't blocking as much as it was trying to ruin Sneva's air that time. I think that was got pumped up a little bit. Say. Spoken like an answer. <laughs> they maintain the interval as the answers continue their battle for third place. Big Al with Buick power, Little Al with Chevrolet. And a little more conservative approach to the engine as compared with, say, Roberto Guerrero or Jim Crawford, right, Bobby? Yes, this, uh, the engine that Big Al is using, it's a Buick, but it has seven butterflies. It's a six-cylinder engine. It has a butterfly on the injectors for every cylinder, plus the old monovalve butterfly in the back. So that's seven for the engine. Made it a lot more drivable. Easier to, easier, easier to start the races and all. Boy, look at Danny wide open eyes as he checks this information that comes up on his dash panel, a computer generated display for him. Look at the speed. Watch the throttle over here. This is an interesting where it says throttle. That's percent of the throttle being open. There's 98 percent. The 98 percent would be 100 incidentally. They're off just a tick. But look at it going through the turns and look where the car is going at the same time. Now, during qualification, some of the practice deals, it would be 100% all the way around, but he's down to 40% there at times. Those are lateral Gs. It's the first time we've seen that in real time. Now, there's no lateral Gs on the main straightaway. Watch, though, as he turns into the corner. Here we go. <laughs> Up to 3.1. That's a bunch. You know, if you turn, pull two and a half Gs in an airplane, you think your head's going to go down with your feet. Three times his body weight, which means that helmet and everything around him is the same increase. I talked to Danny Sullivan the other day when he got back after a few days in Aspen. He went home for a while, and I said, you know, you got a pretty good chance in this race. And he said, I would be happy with fifth. I think now he's going to be... Art. Look Very at the happy RPM with what's over there. You'll see that he has two gears also, like Michael would have, Sam. One for going, one for cruising. He's in the cruise gear right now. Danny Sullivan was running in fifth place during all of those laps. Remains there. That no one in contest at the moment. The Chevrolet engine, Paul, started to mention, would normally turn about 12 and a half thousand RPM if he really wanted to go. 162 laps are complete. Gary Gerald now watches from Scott Goodyear's pits. And indeed, watching anxiously is Derek Walker. Derek, you've got to be delighted. Does this surprise you that you could come from the back of the field to be running second? Well, I think any time you come from the back to, you know, this far up the grid, you've got to be pleased with the results. The guys have worked great all day, made great pit stops, and Scott's been, you know, just doing a great job out there, so we're real pleased. So much attention on Michael Andretti, little Al. Can this team win this race? Oh, yeah, any time you're this close, you can win. we got one more stop to make, and then we're, we're down to the last, you know, fuel tank run. Biggest concern leading to this point? Uh, just running fast enough in traffic is our big problem. All right, Derek Walker watches and waits anxiously, and Scott Goodyear continues to hold second place. 
Derek Walker is the guy that was with Pinsky for so many years. Team manager over Pinsky out is on, on his own right now. They've also penalized the number 68 car of Dominic Thompson for passing under the yellow as well. Just took him a lap down further from his position. So at the front of the field, it remains car number one, Michael Andretti. We'll be back. That white car right there is Michael Andretti. He's overhauling the entire field. No problem whatsoever. The Ford Motor continues to run very well. 229 miles an hour for the last lap. 229.7 for Michael. He's been like a cat playing with a mouse all day. Michael has a lot more reserve. He's in one of those times where he really has this race. Now, I'm not predicting a win, but he certainly had a big advantage all day. Well, you know, we've seen a good deal of uh, Michael's wife, Sandy, in the pits. She has a phrase for when Michael really gets in gear. She says he's on Racer's Planet, and that's where he is right now. Let's go down pit side, Jack Paul, well, do you remember in the old days back when Indy was Indy and a car owner came and only ran the Indianapolis 500? Well, that's the case with this man, John Menard, and he has Al Unser Sr. running in fourth place. John, you've got to be excited about the run. Yeah, my heart's going to jump right out of my chest. I'm really excited. Good news and bad news all month. Now, the question that we've got is, can the Buick last? Have you told Al anything? Well, Al's told us it's running good, and it obviously is. I think it's going to last where we're going to wind up. I don't know. I'm sure hoping. He's a page from the past, Paul. He's one of those true sportsmen. But the look that he likes is right up there on the pole. It shows his car in fourth. There's a guy we go snowmobiling with in the wintertime. John Menard comes from Wisconsin, and he loves to go snowmobiling. Let's consider the top of the order as we watch Michael Andretti continue just to cut around this track at incredible speeds. This turn that lap slowed down quite a bit as he ran through traffic at 221 miles an hour. He's led for all but 23 laps of this race. Michael Andretti. Here's a car with an engine that has not yet won a race. Scott Goodyear, a man who has not ever won an IndyCar race, though so, uh, let us never even finish in the first race. Exactly. Yeah. And Al Unser, who's never won the Indy 500. Big Al, who's with a Buick that has not done particularly well here. Except really for Michael, uh, these are long shots at best that are now running among the leaders. If you go back to the start of the race, you could not have envisioned something like this. But if Michael does go on to win, incidentally, he has become much better with the press and the media. He used to not really care or put any energy into it, certainly not like his dad, Mario, but he was on the Letterman Show last year. He did really well, and of course, if he wins this one, we'll see him on a lot of stuff. There's little Al on board. You can look at how hard the wind is buffeting his head. That gives you an idea. The Lomas have not done well with that wind. I think I mentioned that earlier. There's a dad right behind him, really pushing hard. He's going to start putting the pressure on because remember, the Buick does really have more horsepower than little Al. And there goes Big Al inside a little Al and picks it up. Oh. I guess I guess that was pretty good, and I wasn't trying to, Paul. So Big Al moves up a position, takes up third place. I started to say Little Al's engine is the older Chevrolet, what we call the A model. Big Al is in the Buick. And they have a quite a bit more horsepower than the Chevys do. And Little Al, of course, is in the Galmer chassis. That one won the Switzer Award for Excellence and in Innovation Design, designed by Alan Mertens, of course. Let's go to Jack. Well, Paul, in about two laps, Michael Andretti should be coming in for his final stop. The crew is ready. I asked them if they were going to be making any changes on the car whatsoever. They said, why? 29 laps left with the Indy 500. We're now within the last 100 miles. Well, you see him rip by Cheever there. You know, it was at almost exactly at this point back in the 1987 race that Michael's dad, Mario, had been leading and dominating the race exactly like this with the then new Chevrolet engine. That engine picked that moment to go south, as they say, to fail. One you only know, can was, hold your breath right now. And that was both up with the identical new Ford engines there, so that's always interesting when you know that same chassis, the same engine, and he went by cheaper pretty easy, let's show you how good Michael has been handling. Michael comes on the pit road, ready for what should be his final stop of the race. Remember, they had a fuel refill problem on the last stop. Let's see if this one comes away clean, Jack. 
He oh. says he just hates the pit stops. It's where things can go wrong. And also keep in mind, all the other cars are going to have to pit also. There's another pit stop coming for everybody. So Michael's just making his first. Fuel goes into the car. On goes that last set of good tires that he was saving. The Jack told us about These are the ones that Jack yep. said should be the best, Jack Arrude. Paul, what we've had is a very good pit stop, and let me tell you, they had no problem with the fuel, so he's off and away. 17 seconds in and out, second place car. Scott Goodyear also in and out, his final stop. And that squirt of water, you saw go on there, that's where any spilled alcohol, water dissolved the alcohol quick, so they give it that shot, just in case anybody saw that. Big Al now has the lead of the race. Little Al is in second place, but they too have to stop. Big Al's going to be in two laps. The pit board is out for him now. So we move to the final laps of the race. There he is, the leader, Al Unser. A fifth win today, possibly. Al Unser Jr. on the pit road. He comes to a stop at the Gallus Franco pits. Jerry Punch is right there. Oh, it's not on the rest of the crew now working on little Al's car. They will change tires. They have fuel the car. They're waiting for the fuel. Remember, laps to go. They want to get the fullest possible. 13.9 seconds, and Alan Jr. heads back down pit road. It is fabulous to see this Alan Merton's design car doing this well. They've been very quiet all month long. Big Al coming in in just one lap. You see him there in the yellow car on the right of the screen. One lap to go before he pits. Big Al, 13 seconds. Or excuse me, little Al, 13 seconds. Uh, 17 seconds, but remember, Michael has a lot of speed on these guys plus distance, so they were really slow and careful on Michael's pit stop. And as he heads into the pits, Big Al will have a 14-second lead over Michael Andretti. Michael should be able to retake the lead at the conclusion of Big Al's pit stop, but we'll certainly be watching for that. This will be the last pit stop now for all the remaining cars. Al Hunter Jr. runs in third place right now, just... Uh, about 20 seconds back, and Big Al stays out. Well, Big Al apparently has this a feel for the car, Bobby. And well, knows this is where you take a chance, though. You think to yourself, could something happen? Could I get my stop in under the yellow while everyone else ahead of me has stopped under the green? Well, these cars all have computers on board. They all can see on the dash what there is, Sam. So probably he just decided to say, hey, I'm going to go for that yellow just like you imagined. Always gamble on it. If you throw those hard dice, sometimes you win. Particularly when you're running for it. It's a good moment to gamble. Right. Yeah. Big Al has led now 628 laps, the all-time Indy lap leader. And there he goes, heading for the pit road. Al Unser, the leader of the race, a four-time winner. Will it be five? Jack Root waits for him. And Paul, right now, the concern with this crew is that they make no mistakes. They're awaiting Al Unser Sr., an unemployed race driver, when they initiated practice here. He has brought the car to a stop. Seems to be routine thus far. Al Unser Sr., the last time he was unemployed, he took it over, and Michael Andretti has taken the lead, but Al Unser Sr. won his fourth when he was an unemployed race driver at the start of May. A long stop, 17.6 seconds, but the crew is happy because there were no mistakes. So Big Al makes his stop at Michael Andretti. Michael Andretti is in the seat. You know, when, when Michael gets out in front, like the way you see him, he's just gaining on him as the race goes on. He is just plain hot. Michael is hooked up. He can cruise. He's in his top running gear. Even during the pit stops, he makes them slow, but he still keeps gaining. There's Michael right now, as you can see on the screen. Right now, he has no competition. Standby station break. We'll be right back. Jr. He rides in third place. Ahead of him, Scott Goodyear in second. Bobby Rahal ready to come into the pits. He was in fourth. 
prior to turning down to this stop. Jack and Root. Well, Paul, they're going to make a change on the front wings. The crewman goes to work and takes one half turn out of both front wings as they add fuel. That's the only adjustment they're going to make on Bobby Rayall, other than removing a great deal of trash from the radiator area. Another long stop, only to take on fuel. That's why it was so long, 15 seconds flat. That's a very, very minor adjustment. A half a turn on each one with as small as those front wings are. That's almost a nothing, but he's still working at it. That's a good sign. Out comes Ray Hall, but he falls to fifth place in Scott Goodyear's pit. Here comes A.J. Boyd, still keeping the car alive, running in 11th place. He was supposed to retire last year. He decided he was having too much fun, and A.J. has been a joy to be around this month. So A.J. makes his stop. Routine, taking his time with it. And there he goes after 19 seconds. A.J. Boyd rejoins the fight. Michael Andretti is still the leader of the race. There's Scott Goodyear. Mario, by the way, Mario Andretti was 29 years old when he first won here, his only Indy win in 1969. Michael is... No, Scott Goodyear there, as you see on the screen right there, McKinsey Financial people up in Canada, it's all Canadian. Other than the team, the mechanics themselves, is all Canadian. That was all well right behind them. And you can just imagine how happy they are. They started last. Do we have any cheaper than Pitt getting tires? Fuel? Looks like a routine stop. All right, so Eddie Cheever makes his stop. These are the final stops of the race. Michael Andretti just had a lap at 218 miles an hour. The finish is coming up in Indianapolis. Designated as one of America's national landmarks, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum keeps alive the history of the Indianapolis 500. Come visit with us and find out why the 500 is the greatest spectacle in racing. Back at Indianapolis, the 76 running to the great 500-mile race. Al Unser Jr. is chasing Scott Goodyear. It's a battle for second place. Ahead of this battle, turning laps above 220 miles an hour, is Michael Andretti, the dominant power in this race, and he's 25 seconds ahead of the second-place car. But the battle for second, should anything go wrong with Michael, out front is one of the best we've seen in a long time. Three cars locked in a tight battle, all with the two of them with the Chevrolet engines, Big Al Unser with a Buick, and of course out front, a Ford. Now here's two cars, Goodyear's car and Little Al's car that are virtually identical cars as far as the make, the engines, all that stuff is the same. The air is going to be the big deal here, Sam. Whether or not Little Al can get close enough to him where the dirty air or the mixed up air doesn't bother his handling enough. Now, Scott, as you watch him through the in-car cam, is not going clear down to the grass. This is good for Little Al because Little Al can go a little bit lower and still get air to his front wings. The traffic is really helping Little Al. Look at there, right by. Scott Goodyear, he's going. Can he? There he got by. Why should Little Al goes for second place under Scott Goodyear. Little Al moves into second. 188 laps are complete. Now the reverse is going to happen. Can Scott Goodyear live with that dirty air that Little Al is making up now? Scott Goodyear's wife, Leslie, she watches from the McKenzie pits. Bobby, you said that these two men are driving the same kind of car. Of course, they're not, actually. Little Al has the Galmer chassis, while Scott Goodyear has the Loa. And it's interesting to see that they are handling a little bit differently and cutting through the air a little bit differently. What they share is the same Chevrolet A engine, the kind of engine that has won this race for the last four years. Well, I'll certainly bow to that mistake. They've been on Lola so long, Sam. I got excited <laughs> and I forgot about that. I'll bow to that one. Michael Andretti just turned a lap at 221 points. 2 miles an hour. 11 laps to go in the Indy 500, and Michael is slowing. Michael is slowing. The rest of the field is coming past. Michael Andretti is slowing down. Al Unser Jr. will take the lead as Michael Andretti slows down at Indianapolis.
Indianapolis. An unbelievable turn of events. The man who has dominated this race on the 189th lap. Suddenly the car slows and Michael appears to be done. Paul, well, that is another Andretti thing. It's sad for Michael. I have never seen a race driver in my life that deserves this race more than Michael Andretti, and he isn't even going to make it back to the pits. There come the leaders, first and second. Allen's or Jr., Scott Goodyear. And we've got a whale of a race on the racetrack as Scott Goodyear is closing on Little Al. Now the contest is really going to happen for a race because what those guys know, which they know now, the yellow flag comes out because Michael's car did not make it off the racetrack. And Leslie Goodyear is wondering, can her husband possibly win the race? Jack Arood, you have an update. Paul, it was very simple on the radio. He radioed in, I can't believe it, the engine quit. And about 400,000 people here cannot believe it as well. They are all on their feet. And Michael wants that car back to the pits. If a man ever deserved the accolade of this gigantic crowd, it's Michael Andretti. He led 163 laps. And then turning a lap of only about 220 miles an hour, much slower than he'd been earlier in the day, suddenly the engine shut down. You can hear the people There's cheering him right now. There's his, one of his owners, Paul Newman, wife Sandy, Ed Nathmans. You know, this Steve. shows you how quickly fate changes here at Indianapolis, doesn't it? There's Shelley Unser suddenly, now her husband in with a chance to win this thing. But if you want to talk about fate, 192 laps are complete, eight laps to go. Traditionally, in fact, 12 times in the 76 runnings of the Indianapolis 500, the leader at this point in the race, the man who led at lap 190, does not win the race. Now, and here's the two guys, Little Al and Scott Goodyear, both, who really didn't look like much of a chance of winning this race early on. They had to gamble on different things happening to be competitive. Now, they're one and two and going to have a probably a heck of a battle before the checkered flag falls. Bobby, how important is it to Little Al to take his 500 win? Oh, it's so important. It's more important than any other thing in his life, Paul. He, he, he's the only answer that's raced here that hasn't won, you see. Let's go down to Jerry Punch. Moments ago, this car owner beside me, Rick Gallus, kneeling almost as if in prayer as they were watching his driver come out of turn four. And Rick, laps, laps winding down. It's very, very close. Let's see what happens. It's a two-car race. As Little they Al come toward the green flag, a Little Al now being chased by Scott Goodyear. Goodyear for the biggest finish of his life. Little Al probably has a decisive edge in experience in these situations. If you think back three years ago with his last lap battle with Emerson Fittipaldi, but it may very well be that today Scott Goodyear may have the better machine here. You see Little Al trying to throw him out of his slipstream, his draft there, by cutting across the straightaway. Little Al will weave all over the straightaway, trying to keep Scott Goodyear away. Well, it certainly is, and keep in mind another thing. They have a race gear, a real fast gear, and a cruise gear. Both of these guys are letting all the saving go to the wind now. It's in the go gear right now. And Scott Goodyear closes in behind Al Unser Jr. Remember, Big Al runs in third place right now. The battle though, is at the front of the field. For what is happening to Scott Gibb Goodyear right now, this is incredible. After years of relative obscurity, trying to set his career up to do the right things, suddenly he finds himself with a moment where it could all come right in the biggest possible way. He's got the opportunity on the plate. The strategy right now, for example, is just flat out. There is nothing being saved right now because, remember, Little Al is making dirty air or hard air for Scott Goodyear to run in and leading right now. Running in that clean air is definitely an advantage. This is not a NASCAR race situation where it would be to some advantage for Scott Goodyear to stay in second place. He's not in a position to save fuel. I think if he can make the pass, he's going to make the pass. Buddy, I, I think little Al at this point may be just sheer finding more turn speed, Bobby. And what he's going to do is he can fine-tune the track because he has...
has nobody's dirty air to run in. He can set his fine tune. He'll be running the track in inches in different places. Then to try to figure out the fastest place, and he uses his mirrors behind him, seeing where Scott is, to see whether he's gaining or losing. He Scott is. Goodyear tries to keep out in clean air so he can keep his radiators cool on the car, keep the engine cool. They're turning the laps at 223, almost 224 miles an hour. 196 laps are complete. Little Al told me a week ago, he says, I'm going to have to run the last laps around 225. He darn it, that isn't pretty close, Paul. Neither car in contest at the moment. Scott Goodyear trying desperately to make up the distance. He's inching up on Al Unser Jr. And Scott Goodyear is now right there, right behind Little Al. He follows Little Al down the main straightaway. Anywhere Little Al goes, there is Scott as well. And further, then you weave back and forth like that. You scrub off a little bit of speed, too, but Scott has no, no nothing he can do except to follow him because he needs the drafting. Scott Goodyear, of course, a Canadian early in his career. You see him setting up Little Al now. He seemed to kind of give you the feeling that things were coming easily for him. Then he had a long period there, two, three years, where he just couldn't get any result at all. Suddenly, he's balled it back to this moment. He can see the possibility of winning the Indy 500 if he can make one pass. But he has got to pass one of the savviest, canniest, and most determined drivers in the business. A lot of that's going to come from the old sprint car days. That's where the Lau came from, was go-karts and sprint cars. He's got a lot of savvy on how to keep somebody from passing. The 198th lap in the record books. On this lap in 1989, Emerson Fittipaldi and Little Al touched wheels. Little Al hit the wall. Fittipaldi went on to the west. Scott Goodyear still trying to catch him. Right now, there's no traffic involved in front of him, Paul. This is what got him the last time. And Al Unser Jr. sees Dwayne Sweeney's white flag. Two and a half miles. One more lap to go. If Scott Goodyear has a chance, the time is now. Don't forget, 10 years ago, John Cox and Rick Mears raced on the last lap for the finish. John Cox won that one. That was experience over Rick Mears' relative inexperience. Will that happen again here today? They're on the back stretch. 223 miles an hour on the last lap. No traffic involved. They make the turn for home now. On the main stretch, Scott Goodyear closes in. He looks for a place to come by. Scott Goodyear tries it, but no. I believe that's the closest finish in Indy history. Closer than the race 10 years ago when Gordon Gott, John Cox beat Rick Mir. 10 years ago when Little Al was new to this track. And now, Al Unser Jr. is a winner at the Indianapolis 500. That was the most fabulous finish I've ever seen. I've never seen any Scott Goodyear did, or little Al. They zigzagged all over the racetrack, did everything they could to mess each other up or whatever that you try to do. Scott Goodyear pulls alongside and salutes the new winner. Remember, though, Scott has nothing to be ashamed of. Let's go to Jerry Punt. We're, we're with Rick Gallus, and Rick, congratulations on an outstanding effort today. Well, oh, my guys, and I'll tell you, Al Jr.'s got a lot of, he got the heart of an elephant. It was funny, nobody talked about us all month. And this race team, just they just keep getting after it and getting after it. And we're not big talkers, but I, I'm really proud. Man, this feels good, Jerry. Hey, good things happen to good people. After qualifying, this has to make up for all the disappointment. We just worked hard all month by engineers. The new Galmer, I think it'll, I think uh, Robin Miller said that it wasn't too good on ovals, and we just, uh, we're real proud to be here. The winning car owner for the so Indianapolis. I want to say to all the people in New Mexico, because this was a win for New Mexico as well. Rick Gallus, the winning car owner here at Indianapolis 500. Here were the last few hundred feet of the run as Scott Goodyear looked for a place to get past. Came out to the inside. And as they came to the line, Scott Goodyear had a little bit of a roll, but it wasn't enough. But look at that. And his front wheels up with little Al's rear wheel. I'll tell you what, he got the USAC scoring computer because the computer says the interval first to second was point zero. <laughs> Al Unser Jr. from his onboard camera has taken the 76 running 
of the Indianapolis 500. Little Al's first win. On a plane not so long ago, Little Al confided to me he was worried that he might never win this race. Like great masters like Ted Horn, Eddie Sachs. And it was close. By the time they got to the first turn, look at this from high over the starter. There's the interval. That is the first time in Indy history that two cars have actually finished abreast of each other. The closest finish in history, won by Little Al. Here's Jack. Well, Paul, he's getting the congratulations of his crew, Owen Snyder, his wife, Shelley, Al Unser Jr., who came here in 1989. You heard it earlier where he says there comes a time during the course of a race when you don't care about whether you're going to live or die, what's most important is winning, and he has done it today, something that... He has sought for so many years a third and 89, two-fourths. And Al Unser Jr., welcome to Indianapolis 500 history. You finally got one. Thank you very much. I tell you, I, I almost took a little too easy off turn four, but... We got it. We got it. We got it. This says a lot right here. These two men that have worked so hard. You did it, partner! <laughs> <laughs> and I just... I almost took it too easy off for you, and Scott got a run on me, but uh, <laughs> but I just want to thank everybody, my my crew doing super pit stops, and my sponsor, Valvoline, and everybody. I tell you. Hey, when you were a kid, Al, you waited for this moment. You dreamt about it, to take the swig of milk, emblematic of winning the Indy 500. Al, <laughs> let me ask you. The one question, though, is all month. All right, Al. All month, nobody talked about your chances to win the Indy 500. Did you think you had a chance? No, not really. You know, Michael Addis covered all day, and uh, and the Lola, the Ford Lola Cosworths just outrun us bad all day. And so, you know, the best we could do is was best in class. And uh, there's a lot of it sounds like there's for. there sounds like there's some tears in your voice right now. Well, you just don't know what Indy means. <laughs> Yeah, let me get the Yep. Hey, Al. Are you done, Jack? Junior. Congratulations from Alan Mertens. This is just a very moving victory lane, gentlemen. Consider this. Bobby Unzer won on May 24th, 1981. Al Unzer won on May 24th, 1987. Little Al wins on May 24th of 1992 in the closest finish ever at the Indianapolis 500. So close that the computer has not yet resolved the winning difference. And those are the only three times this race has ever been held on May 24th. Al Unzer, his father, comes home in third place. This was Shelley watching in the last lap of the race. Look at the emotion there. And then she knows he has it. She didn't know that until after he passed in front of her pits just about 100 yards down from the start finish line in the historic yard of brick. That lake the time sometimes you live 10 years. There you see Scott Goodyear as he pulled to the inside. And Little Al raised his fist in the air just as he streaked over the finish line. The Gillette Company, maker of the Gillette Sensor Shaving System, the revolutionary razor that adjusts to the contours of your face, and Right Guard Antiperspirant and Deodorant for maximum protection against wetness and odor, is pleased to announce that Mary Ann Ward of Kittery, Maine, has won the beautiful Chevrolet Corvette in the Gillette Halfway Challenge. And the celebration continues on the victory platform in front of the master control tower at the Indianapolis 500. The final Valvoline race summary of the day, 13 caution periods, only 12 cars finishing this race. A very slow average speed due to that enormous number of cautions. 
And how about second place, Scott Goodyear? Here's Gary Gerald. Well, Paul, 12 years ago, Tom Sneva started dead last, finished second, but it wasn't as close as this time, the closest finish ever. Here's the man who ends up being the disappointed second place man. What a thrill, though, to be so close to be in that kind of a contest and nearly win the Indy 500. Well, it is a disappointment because for the last few laps, I thought this is really a possibility, and I was wondering where Michael was, and as soon as I saw him go out, I yelled over the radio to Derek and the guys in the Walker Motorsport team, Michael's out, Michael's out, yellow flag, and then I knew it was a two-car race, and fortunately, we just drove flat out for the last few laps, and uh, the McKenzie Lola and the McKenzie team, the guys did great throughout the whole month. We had an up-and-down month, gave me a great car to uh, go racing with today, but we just didn't have enough to get up and get past them. We thank you for a great thrill. We wish you continued success thank as we you. go to Jerry Punch. Thank you. You're watching Michael Andretti, a, a car and driver who dominated this 76 running today, being pulled back to the garage area. What a disappointment for another one of the Andretti family. Michael, obviously hoping to get out of the car and make it to Methodist Hospital as fast as he can, but very, very disappointed sitting in the car as he is being towed back to gasoline alley. Paul? Michael, of course, concerned with injuries to both his father and to Jeff Andretti. We'll go through the entire field now. Of course, the win taken by Al Hunter Jr. They say that second is not remembered. I guarantee you, Scott Goodyear and that second place will be remembered for a very long time. Lynn St. James comes home in 11th, the only rookie running at the finish of this race. The eighth win for the Unser family. And the first time at Indianapolis that a driver has won from the 12th starting spot. The closest finish ever, and it's won by Al Unser Jr. And Scott Goodyear comes home in second, and little Al's dad comes behind in third. Next year, May 30th, 1993, the 77th running of the Indianapolis 500. This is Paul Page, so long from Indianapolis.